Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the city's biennial candidates forum presented by the Coral Gables Chamber of Commerce. Tonight's program is brought to you in a hybrid format. Um, we have a limited audience in person with the candidates and guests and the chamber, the city leaders, and our hosts from the University of Miami. And then so many of you watching at home via Zoom meetings, Facebook Live, or on a taped rebroadcast in this forum. We're the only forum to be hosting live with candidates in person this year, something that we believe strongly protects the integrity of the process. and It allows the candidates to interact authentically with each other in the same space. We're also very proud to be the first forum of the 2021 election cycle. Thank you for understanding our need to be mindful of these times and the need to put health and safety first. Thank you to our candidates for working with us in these unusual circumstances. It is our honor to once again present tonight's forum in partnership with several community organizations and in concert with our host, the University of Miami. While these events take a tremendous amount of time and planning, especially in these socially distant times, we believe it is in the best interest of our city beautiful to do the heavy lifting for your as your number one ranked Coral Gables Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for your faith in us, and thank you to our members for their amazing work on your behalf as we present tonight's forum. Let me recognize a few special guests, uh, Commissioner Mike Mena, Commissioner George Fors, former Mayor Jim Kaysen. Thank you all for being here. Um, tonight's program is going to occur in three parts. Uh, first, Commission Group 2, and then Group 3 at around 710, followed by the Mayor's Race, Group 1, at approximately 8. Uh, I want to say a special thanks to our lead sponsor, Ephraim Sora, I'm sorry, Ephraim, Ephraim Sora, owner of Sora Global Insurance and Consulting, Sora Global Risk Advisor, is a gem investor in the Chamber of Commerce. And I'd like to invite him up to say a few words. Ephraim? Good evening, everybody. It's uh, always a pleasure. We, uh, this is the second uh, um, event that, that we host uh, of this sort. We did it a couple of years ago. We do it again, and we'll keep doing it as long as uh, we are able to. And this is an amazing opportunity for all of you, whether you, you're on uh, Zoom or whether you're here present, to uh, take a look at your candidates, uh, see who they are. A little bit about Sora Global and very short, Sora Global Risk Advisors. Uh, we are what we say, we are risk advisors. We look at the, your businesses from a global perspective and we make sure that all your risks are covered. In other words, we go beyond insurance to make sure that your company is profitable. And that's what Sora Global does. And again, thank you so much for the Chamber for holding uh, this event. Thank you uh, to UM for uh, always being so gracious and having them in their home. And thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Efrain. You know, I, I don't think people have really given credit. So one of the, the great difficulties of the pandemic is the inability to lick your fingers as you go to turn a page. Uh, that is a special challenge that I'm, I'm experiencing tonight. Um, I'd also like to recognize a few of our supporting partners. Uh, who helped get the word out tonight, beginning with Maria Gralia of Stern Weaver Miller. Maria is the chair of our Business and Government Affairs Committee. Uh, next is the Coral Gables Democratic Club, a supporting sponsor tonight. The Coral Gables Democratic Club welcomes Democrats from the city of Coral Gables and surrounding areas in Miami-Dade County. They are committed to educating local Dems about important issues, supporting democratic values, and helping Dems get elected at the local, state, and federal level. We recognize Elizabeth Newman, who has joined us tonight, and their president, Benton Snag. Finally, we had two additional sponsors who asked to remain anonymous, but are part of our Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, Gable's Good Government Committee, President Tom Snook, and former Mayor Don Slesman. The League of Women Voters of Miami-Dade are partners tonight as well. Thank you all. It's my distinct pleasure to recognize our lead volunteers who helped make tonight possible. Please welcome to the stage our chair of the Coral Gables Business, Coral Gables Chamber, Business and Government Affairs Committee, Maria Gralia of Stern Weaver Miller, a sponsor tonight. Maria. Um, 
Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I want to thank the University of Miami, Rudy Fernandez. I don't see him, but I'm sure he's either. Oh, there. Okay. Rudy. Hello. <laughs> um, so I also want to thank uh, Maite Alvarez and her associate, Adrian Nunez, as well as Richie Kenny and Kiana McDavid for their support tonight. So thank you very much. Um, and for everyone here for being here tonight and those that are, are watching um, from their homes. Now on the program, it's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator this evening, Dr. Gregory Cougar, Professor and Chair, Department of Political Science at the University of Miami. Gregory Cougar is a Professor of Political Science at the University of Miami. He specializes in legislative politics and political parties. After earning his BA at the Willamette University, he worked as a legislative assistant in the US House for over two years and then went on to earn his PhD from UCLA. Gregory Cougar is the author of Filibustering, a political history of obstruction in the House and Senate, very timely for this time and age, um, published in 2010 by the University of Chicago Press and Strategic Party Government with Matthew Lebo, also published by the University of Chicago Press. Filibustering was awarded the 2011 Fino Prize for the best book on legislative studies. Cougar's research on filibustering in the Senate has led to interviews with the Washington Post, Fresh Air with Terry Gross, one of my favorites, and testimony before the Senate Rules Committee. So now I'd like to introduce Professor Cougar. All right, thank you very much. Um, and I thank you to the chamber for the opportunity to moderate this debate. This is an exciting time for Coral Gables, for the state of Florida, and I'm happy to participate. Um, I wanna specify that the, the questions I'll be asking were uh, drawn from a range of citizens of Coral Gables, but in the end, uh, compiled by me, and written by me, uh, and they have not been shared with the Chamber of Commerce or any candidates. So they are fresh to everyone here. Um, now, let me introduce the six candidates running for office in group two who have joined me on the dais in alphabetical order. Uh, Rhonda Ann Anderson, uh, Tanya Cruz Jimenez, Alexander Lewis Hack, uh, Myra Jolie, Claudia Miro, and uh, Jose Valdez Fowley. Uh, please welcome them. Please note that they are seated in a socially distanced manner with individual microphones. Uh, now allow me to share a few rules of engagement for the evening. Uh, in order to maintain the timeliness of tonight's program and proper decorum, we would like to set some ground rules for tonight's dialogue, which all candidates have been for informed of in advance. And we ask the courtesy of the same from you in the audience. Um, first of all, uh, several of the candidates have uh, signed a positive campaign pledge organized by the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, this commits candidates to uh, focusing on, on uh, positive messages about issues, about themselves, about uh, Coral Gables, uh, and refraining from negative attacks upon others, and encouraging their supporters to do the same. Uh, those candidates are Anderson, uh, Buccello, uh, Menendez, Jolie, Valdez Fowley, Miro, and Kian. I did submit one. And Cruz Jimenez. <clears throat> Very well. Um, now, going on. For the debate tonight, uh, insulting or slanderous remarks, heckling or verbal outbursts during the program will not be tolerated. This includes booing and hissing. Uh, anyone exhibiting this type of behavior will be asked to leave by staff or UM security. Now, for those of you watching live or on replay at home, this does not apply to you. Pause for laughter. Signs, placards, banners, palm cards, pamphlets, or campaign materials are not permitted inside the auditorium or for distribution. Uh, live audience, please hold your applause until all candidates have made their concluding remarks at the end of each session. I thank you for your cooperation, and I hope you will find this to be an informative evening. Uh, as discussed earlier, I won't repeat, the program will, divide into, will be divided into three parts tonight. 
um, with commission candidates in group two up first. Um, during each session, the first portion will be focused on prepared questions and time permitting. We will then transition into questions submitted online via Facebook or Zoom chat. Uh, only I know which questions will be asked. Uh, the program will be conducted in the following manner. I will introduce all the candidates by group in the race in alphabetic order, done. Uh, each candidate will have 90 seconds for opening remarks at the beginning of each session. Responses to questions posed to the commission candidates will be limited to about one minute as well, although we will allow for more free flowing discussion as it naturally occurs. I will manage this along with any opportunity for rebuttal, again, at my sole discretion. Candidates are asked not to address each other directly in their comments or responses, but to direct their comments through the moderator and to the audience here and at home. Our timekeeper is Monique Selman of Albany Home Construction, and she will provide you a countdown uh, on responses from the one minute mark. She is seated directly in front of the dais and a bell will ring when time is up. Pierce. Now let us begin with opening statements, beginning with Ms. Anderson. Due to the rest of you. Good evening, I'm Ron Anderson. I want to thank the Chamber and the University of Miami for holding this event. It's indeed a wonderful thing that you do this for us and for the residents. I've been a resident for 33 years and my husband has been a resident since 1955 in the city of Coral Gables. And for the past 16 years, since 2004, I became active in my community uh, when issues came up. We had problems with speeding drivers. We had problems with development coming in. And I worked with the community as well as the developers to find common ground to get traffic calming added to uh, put things in to improve our community, such as the Segovia median. I worked on development density issues that our neighborhood didn't want and I worked on increasing notice to all residents who, so they can participate in all the discourse that we need to have at the commission and at uh, meetings in order to have a better result for everybody. Additionally, I worked on sustainability issues, resiliency for our city to be able to go into the next century. Uh, we have many issues to address there, septic to sewer, water pollution, and sea level rise. I've uh, decided to run because in order to accomplish all these issues, uh, we need additional votes on the commission. I've consistently and patiently waste, waited, uh, listened to folks, and my dedication and patience to listen has been demonstrated in my time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ms. Cruz Jimenez. Good evening, and thank you for this opportunity. Again, my name is Tanya Cruz Jimenez. I live in the North Gables and my office is within walking distance in our downtown corridor. Both my girls attend Coral Gables Preparatory Academy. Put simply, everything that matters to me is right here within these city's limits. The crippling impact of the pandemic coupled with the mismanaged streetscape project and its unacceptable delays and cost overruns inspired me to run. It became evident to me as the pandemic wore on that we did not have a holistic vision to revitalize our downtown and that the current piecemeal approach that we've been following simply was not cutting it. It would only assure that we would be facing these same issues, issues related to traffic, uh, a failing business district and overdevelopment yet again with no real resolution in sight as we've been doing in the past. Beyond that, the more residents I spoke to, the more it became evident that a number of residents' needs were not being adequately met. As someone who lives, works, and plays in Coral Gables, I am fully invested in the future of this community. If elected, I will work with all stakeholders to ensure that we can forge a resilient vision for our city's next century that helps to preserve our quality of life for all generations. Thank you. Mr. Hack. Good evening. What I have to offer the city of Coral Gables is a fresh set of ideas and someone who will speak truth to power. I have no ties to special interests or connections to political families. As such, to address the issues within our city will require a great deal of creativity and thinking outside the box. 
to address parking, we will need to update or allow for a grace period for street parking. I've also looked into garages that stack the cars to save on space. In regards to development, I believe in balanced development. That is, does this development help Coral Gables as a whole? If a storefront's electrical wiring needs updating or using a space more wisely than what is occurring right now in the crafts, and the recent talks and resolution for Miracle Mile are a step in the right direction, but I would still ask, how will the commission incentivize small businesses? How will the commission make it possible to make young professionals come live in the city? I believe by making the process easier and changing the website interface to be more user-friendly will attract more people and be less of a deterrent. Thanks to the crafting of my campaign manager, Samantha Duran, I have dedicated a position on accessibility for our disabled residents. We're on the right track, but we can always do and be better. Last year, the city declared a climate emergency and to follow through, we need to be making Coral Gables carbon neutral and that is a priority and we need to be working to invest and incentivize businesses to be more eco-friendly and that's a step in the right direction. We've seen the lackluster performance of our city commission and someone who will take the concerns of the city seriously is where I stand as a candidate. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Jolie. Good evening, parents and non parents too. Uh, my name is Myra Jolie. I've been living in Coral Gables for 17 years. I moved to Coral Gables because we wanted to give our son, Ishmael Befeira, the sense of uh, family um, tradition that me as a Caribbean um, born um, was used to. My husband, Stephen Befra, a professor at the University of Miami, adjunct professor at the law school uh, from Minnesota and uh, from Dominican Republic in Minnesota, we met in Coral Gables at John Martin's a legacy that is already gone. We um, play, live, and we walk the streets of Coral Gables. Nobody that I know know more about Coral Gables and its traditions besides the, the Historic Preservation you know, Club, but that my husband is Stephen Befra. I learn to love, besides the fact that Coral Gables is one of the most beautiful cities in the world, if we wanna be mothers, mothers will say Florida. And we love Coral Gables because of what it is, tradition. Like that great old pair of jeans that no matter how many times you wash it, you put it back and you feel right at home. And that's why we live here. That's why we pay the taxes that we pay. And that's why we vote to get people elected that will listen to the residents of Coral Gables because they are the bosses. And that's why I'm here. Ms. Ma Ms. Miro. Okay. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. My name is Claudia Miro. I've been a resident of the North Gables for over 15 years at the same address. I've been working in the public sector for over 20 years. I'm a working single mom. My son, Lucas, is 12 years old. He attends the public school, which Coral Gables uh, Prep Academy, plays ball at the youth center, and we're involved in our community. I decided to run for office because I started seeing these, uh, all these like, monster-sized buildings popping up all over Coral Gables, and I asked myself why. I felt that it was going to be threatening the quality of life that we enjoy here. And I felt it was time for me to get involved. More recently, I saw some of the dismissive attitudes that were coming from the dais. And I felt that maybe um, the dais could use people from the community that had a real interest in the neighborhood and um, didn't have political ties and didn't come from political dynasties and were not in the pockets of special interests. Um, I also am uniquely qualified to serve because I didn't just decide to do this. I've been serving the public for 20 years. I studied, um, I have a master's degree in public administration, which is a degree that you study to learn how to run government, city government. Um, I have the experience. I know how to get the job done. And this is why I ask for your support because I know that I will do this in the best interest of the, of the residents, make sure that we don't allow runaway development in our city beautiful. And I ask for your support. Claudia Miro, number 77 on your ballot. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Valdez Valley. Hi. I'm 
I'm sorry. Um, again, thank you, Mark. Thank you for the chamber for doing this in the University of Miami. I decided to run because I feel that the commission right now needs some common sense brought into the commission. The commission needs someone with financial expertise. It, the law is covered on the commission now and with the candidates that are running. We need business experience. I have 35 years in banking, 25 of those spent as CEO and president of four banks, very successful. I was able to retire 12 years ago. Fortunately, we did well, and I, this will become my full-time job. I do not have any other employment. So I will be dedicating all my time to this. My, I have also been classified by the Securities and Exchange Commission as a financial expert, having served as the head of the audit committee in a public company. I have also been involved in the community-wide from being a trustee of Florida International University, president of Mercy Hospital, and a lot of arts groups, and all those positions have come with very generous donations on our part. I feel that the city, that the commission needs some common sense and business expertise to lead it. And I think that a lot of people that are saying, this is a problem and that is a problem, I think they need to come up with the solutions also, not just identify the problem. Thank you. All right. Thank you all very much. Um, so I'll now begin a series of questions. Uh, as, I ask que as I ask my questions, I'll be rotating uh, who goes first uh, throughout the field of candidates. So you each get a chance to uh, have a different order in the questioning. Uh, so this question is for uh, Ms. Cruz Jimenez. Ready? Uh, what will be your likely first piece of legislation uh, offered as a new city commissioner if you get elected? Well, one of the things that I would want to focus on is bringing our city into the 21st century, finally. So many of our processes and procedures are absolutely antiquated and user unfriendly. And so, for example, online permitting, e-permitting. I know that we're slated to bring it in August of 2022, but we need to expedite that. The current paper review system that we're using is not only cumbersome, costly, it's environmentally unfriendly, and it makes no sense. By simply expediting this process from paper review to, uh, to e-permitting, we can have concurrent review of each discipline. We can ensure that there is efficiency, that there is accountability, and that there is transparency, and we can improve our customer service. And by the same token, I would look to audit all city processes and procedures, again, with an eye towards efficiency and streamlining and customer service. Thank you. Mr. Hack, your first piece of legislation. Uh, so I, I as well would uh, invest heavily on the updating of our user interface, specifically the website. Not only would online permitting be more efficient, but it would also bring in more of those small businesses. I have spoken to friends of mine that work in Miracle Mile or close to the mile, and they have spoken that the website is extremely user unfriendly and acts as a deterrent and there is no consistency. That's why if elected, I would see greater, uh, greater consistency within the website as well as this would bring in those small businesses that would fill the spaces within Miracle Mile and that would generate revenue and be a great asset to Coral Gables in the long run. All right, uh, Ms. Jolie. When elected, my first piece of legislation is going to be cleaning the house. We first have to see what we have, where we can improve money-wise. We're going to stop every one of the commissioner's pet projects. We are going to make sure we don't have no conversations about changing no zoning regulations from day one. There will be absolutely no regulations on developing. We're going to find out what connections every one of us have it with every project that is right now on the table. And that is my angle. 
uh, Ms. Miro. Thank you. I would focus um, my attention to transparency. One of the things that I keep hearing when I'm going door to door and meeting voters is how did this happen? How are all these buildings popping up? And I, a lot of people are not aware what was going on in the meetings. So one of the first things I would do is I would move to have alternate commission meetings so that we could have these meetings, especially those that have to do with construction or development, have them at night so that those people who are working during the day or have other daytime commitments have an opportunity to participate. And along with that, um, along with the goal of transparency, I would remove the use of acronyms from all public meetings. I hear people talking about the FAR and the TDR and mom and pop at home don't really know what's going on. So I think that we need to make the process so that the average person, the average resident can understand what is going on with these construction projects and how it's going to affect them. That would be my focus. Transparency. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Valdez Fowler. Well, one of, one of the things that I would do is I think being a commissioner and coming in, you're one of five. And I think it is your responsibility to work with the commissioners and work with the city staff and the city manager to try to accomplish some things that you would like. I am very concerned about the budgets because of what's coming down in the future that I have discussed with the property reassessment. I would like to work with the city manager and his budgeting people to see how the budget works, if we can do a bottom-up budget instead of a top-down budget and see what kind of savings there could be there. But again, I will work with what's there. I will not come in and start attacking and criticizing anybody in the staff or in the commission because I am one vote and I will work with everyone to try to accomplish the goals. Thank you. Ms. Anderson. I don't disagree with uh, my colleagues up here that all these are important issues, um, but I do think that the core of one of the biggest things that the residents are concerned with is the size of development, the density of development, and at the root of that is our Mediterranean ordinance, and I think is not quite serving the interests of the residents the way it used to, and the as of right projects that we get zero notice of. I believe there's an appetite on the commission to look at this in detail, and we should have a complete uh, forum with the residents and have a robust discussion about it and amend it. All right, thank you all. Uh, the next question is addressed first to Mr. Hack. Several high profile police related deaths over the last two years have involved citizens suffering from mental illness. Would you support having the police department hire mental health specialists within its existing budget to help improve police interactions with the mentally ill? I, yes, I would uh, agree and side with the police in, in this regard, but uh, I have included a point in my platform regarding sobering centers. I think that if we can uh, take, off, take off some of the burden that is on the police, I think that would see a greater usage of these social services on our city and not put so much of the burden and so much of the responsibility on the police department. But if it requires one to be cooperative, then yes, I would certainly work with them in that endeavor. Thank you. Ms. Jewelry. No, I will not put more restraint in the police department because we mentioned that it's gonna be within their budget. Unless there is money for that, I oppose to it because the police, they're doing the job that I don't want to do. They put their, their lives on the line for our protection. There is no better uh, group of men and women than the Coral Gables police. When we need them, they're right there. So when something happened in some other area, they want to punish our guys or something somebody did. No, we have to encourage them to be better, to be best. And that comes from giving them incentive. If we're gonna have a program, we're gonna have the money to give them in addition to, and everyone who participates, it will be rewarded. We need to back our blues. The answer is no. Ms. Miro. Would you please repeat the question? Certainly. Um, 
Would you support having the police department hire mental health specialists within its existing budget to help improve police interactions with the mentally ill? I think that anything that is going to add to the police department's tool belt, any tools that's going to help them better perform their job is something positive. Um, I would also take into consideration how the officers feel about that. Um, right now, we have an amazing police department, amazing response times in the city of Coral Gables, and we have to make sure that we do everything that we can to keep and, and, and retain the quality police officers that we have, whether that is making sure that they're getting the benefits that they deserve, the salary that they deserve, to make sure that we are um, keeping our community safe. So anything that will help them do their job better, help them deal with whatever situation they come across while they're out there protecting our streets and our families, I would be in favor of. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Valdez Valley. I'm very proud of our police department. I think they are incredibly sensitive. The way they handled the Floyd murder by standing with the people, kneeling with the people, is just a study in sensitivity. And I think that I am very proud of them. I will support them. I think Ed Hudak has, knows what the needs are. Ed Hudak, for all of you that might not know, two years ago before he became popular, hired an LGBTQ uh, liaison that is in the department. And that is being done now in all the departments all over the country. He was ahead of it. What I do think is that the policemen themselves need to sort of police themselves and be on the lookout for their, the people that work with them and see if there are any problems or any needs that they can identify. But I will support anything they need and anything they request and anything that they prove that they need. Ms. Anderson. I concur with Mr. Valdez Folly. I completely support uh, Chief Hudak's um, handling of the department. And I applaud for what he does. He has put in uh, additional folks for additional training. And um, if he can work within his budget to have that mental health aspect, uh, absolutely it should be done. However, if the chief said that he needed additional resources for that, I think that our city would, um, you know, be, I'd be proud of it to, to look for the funds, to be able to support the police department. Ms. Cruz Jimenez. <laughs> I agree with my colleagues. There is no doubt that our fire and police are second to none. But with that said, um, I have members of the family, small children who are on the spectrum. And if you're not familiar with that type of behavior, you may think that they're acting out in a certain way. And so I think that the training is important because some of these children, because they because of neurological issues, behavioral issues, they react a certain way that may seem aggressive to someone without the necessary training. With that training, we can avoid numerous trage tragedies that have occurred um, throughout Florida and throughout other states. And so I would, assuming there is the money, I would absolutely support that level of training just to ensure that we never have a problem. And if we can't find the money, then I would look for it. Because again, it's worth it. An investment to prevent a tragedy, I would do it. Thank you. All right, thank you all. Uh, the next question is first addressed to Ms. Jolie. Uh, and the question is, Illuminate Coral Gables concludes this weekend and has garnered national press for its success. How will you support the arts as a member of the commission? Certainly, we will, we will not be through more development in that percentage for art and public places. We are right now, we are in a, in a situation in which we should leave the arts to the side for now until we find ways to replenish our pension programs, ways to get the money for our firefighters and our police department because we have Godzilla and King Kong growing up everywhere, but we don't have the enough police department, uh, uh, police officers, and we don't have enough resources for in case a fire happens because those fires are not gonna be virtual. They're gonna be real. So 
Therefore, we have to put our art aside because we can wait for a year to look at beautiful art and put the money where it's necessary, our men and women in uniform. Thank you. Ms. Mira. I'm in support of the arts and anything that would come to the city to bring um, more awareness to arts and also uh, families. One of the things that we love about Coral Gables, um, our family, is we love uh, museum night that actually gallery night has, has been missing because of the COVID, right? And anything that um, having been able to go to the different, different uh, exhibitions around the city has been fun. And I think that that's what we need. That's what makes our city so great is the fact that we have some culture, that we have walkable streets, that we have all these things that we can do, um, take the freebie to and, and participate in. So I uh, would support any projects that would come here just to put us on the map more so with, uh, with the arts, arts and public places. I love that, I enjoy that. I love walking and, and driving around our city and seeing um, all the beautiful things that we have already naturally, plus the art that enhances that. So anything that will enhance our, our arts in the city, I'm completely for and supportive of. Mr. Valdez Valley. Thank you so much for the plugs for two of my pet projects. I was on the board of Illuminate and very instrumental in getting it started with the help of some other community leaders. Uh, it was cut back tremendously because of the COVID, but I still think it was very successful. And thank you again for the plug on uh, uh, gallery nights because it's all started at the museum, Coral Gables Museum, of which I'm on the board and was very instrumental in, in turning over the museum and getting it to where it is today. So I am a firm believer in the arts as a means of revitalizing the community. Every time you have gallery night or Friday nights, the community is out in full force. We have had up to 2000 people coming through the museum on a particular night. And those are people that are eating at the restaurants, visiting the businesses. And I think it is a tremendous for the community, for the chamber, for the business development district, for everything. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Anderson. I applaud your uh, efforts on uh, illuminate Coral Gables and the uh, cultural aspects that have brought so much business to this community, Mr. Valdez uh, I believe that it's critical that we continue the partnership with the chamber, with the bid business improvement district to help stimulate people to come <clears throat> to Coral Gables. Illuminate Coral Gables is a fabulous project as the predecessor projects that we've had before. Many people will remember the umbrella project and how much business it brought to Geralda it revitalized it. It's vibrant now. And we can do the same thing with Miracle Mile, with, with a multitude of facets, with the arts, as well as bringing in new businesses to that uh, area. Um, much more that we can do. I think we, we can't let up now. We are gonna have a vibrant downtown if we, if we keep up with this. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Cruz Jimenez. I am a lifelong supporter of the arts. Um, and if there's one thing that I think has been clear to everyone who's traversed downtown lately, especially in the evenings and Geralda, is that the outdoor dining and the illumination project that Mr. Valdez Valley was involved in have done wonders to activate our downtown and to bring life back. We need more of these. Um, where, we're, where we have vacant storefronts right now, why don't we have pop-up art galleries like we do in one of the 300 block Miracle Mile uh, stores? We need to collaborate with our own University of Miami, with the city museum, cinema and theater to again, come up with more events and other organizations so that we can make Coral Gables a cultural destination and a leader in the same way that it was some years back. Again, I commend Valdez Fali on the uh, gallery nights, and I think that we should bring that back and perhaps send the freebie to residential areas to pick up residents. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hack. I, as well, am a big supporter of the arts. And uh, one of the many things that I like to do in Coral Gables is go to the Coral Gables Art Cinema and see what... Uh, 
weird and independent films are playing or go to the Miracle Theater and see what is being performed. It's happy to see that the Miracle Theater has begun in-person performances again. The arts are important, and that is what we have seen thanks to the, uh, the planning of Mr. Valdez Fowley with Illuminate Coral Gables. It's a step in the right direction, and I think that the arts is a vital aspect to the identity of Coral Gables. All right, thank you, very, thank you all very much. Uh, the next question is addressed uh, first to Ms. Miro. Um, here it goes. The Southwest Florida Regional Climate Change Compact predicts that sea levels will rise 10 to 17 inches by 2040. This will directly affect Coral Gables, particularly residents who live along Biscayne Bay and internal waterways. One response is to mitigate the damage by building flood barriers and seawalls and improving freshwater systems to prevent sea seawater seepage. Who should bear the costs of sea level rise? the residents who are most affected, the city of Coral Gables, the state of Florida, or the federal government? I worked, uh, I spent some time working for the South Florida Water Management District and was exposed to all these issues having to do with uh, stormwater runoff and uh, seepage and sea level rise. And I think that it's important that we all collaborate as partners with the state there's, there's so many players involved, the Army Corps of Engineers, the Water Management District, the state of Florida, the governor's office, everyone has to collaborate because um, the uh, limits of our city are only apparent on a map. If we have issues with sea level rise and coral gables, it's only a matter of time before it starts to affect the neighboring uh, municipalities. So um, uh, the good news is that we have, now the county has a, um, a chief bay officer. And I think that the city of Coral Gables will need to work together with the county and with all the other bodies of government that are involved to help um, make sure that we don't have uh, sea level rise issues here in the city of Coral Gables. Mr. Valdez Valley. Well, this, this is a, a, I read when Mr. Kaysen was, um, or Mayor Kaysen was uh, mayor, he worked a great deal on the sea level rise. And it is a very serious issue for Coral Gables because there's a lot of houses and I don't know how many, I forget the number that, that he said, a lot of the houses that are on canals that have bridges to the bay will not be able to get out. I read the sustainability plan of, um, of Coral Gables that was written in 15. And one thing that draws my attention to it is that it, all it talks about is Coral Gables, we're gonna have electric cars, we're gonna, but to deal with the sea level rise, it's a county thing, it's a derm, it's all the governmental agencies. And we are not in a silo alone that, you know, we have to work with the rest of the county and the rest of the municipalities to get, to attain what we need. Ms. Anderson. Sea level rise, we're sitting on a sponge with our aquifer and we will have to work with both the city, the state and the federal government in order to get what we need. We also have the same type of issue with uh, doing the septic to sewer conversion. It's an enormous project. We can't do it alone or without conferring with the county. The pipes have to be connected. We have to decide what kind of system to put in. And the same sort of cohesive system has to be done for sea level rise, a combination of walls, dunes, and other types of valves to be able to stop the, the water from coming in. The uh, comprehensive study that was done is excellent. We are gonna have to live, learn to live with water. We're gonna have to change our building code to learn to live with water. So we need to work together with the county to make that happen. Thank you. Ms. Cruz and Menace. Sea level rise is a crucial issue for Coral Gables. As Mr. Valdez Valley noted, we have, I believe it's 301 waterfront properties in addition to waterways that we use. And so we need to take this very seriously. The county recently issued a sea level strategic rise plan, which I would want our colleagues to review in detail and see what we can implement and work with commissioners Rebecca Sosa and Raquel Regalado to see how we can implement them. Um, 
beyond that, well, as to the, the report itself, one of the two salient points is that if you have waterfront property, you should build high like in the Keys. And if it's low lying property, you should build on fill. And because water knows no boundaries, we have to coordinate with other municipalities, with the county, the state, and federal levels. And I do have relationships there that can be very beneficial and can help us with funding. And also we should seek grants. Thank you. Mr. Hack. As you know, Coral Gables is a huge flood zone. We see this every hurricane. It drowns for weeks at a time. And with the ever rising sea levels, if we don't answer these issues, we will drown for good and it will be irreparable. We need to encourage businesses to be more sustainable and establish those incentives like a carbon tax. Raising seawalls will help in the short term, but we also need to think, be thinking in the long run. And as our city moves into the post COVID world, we need to take a good look at how we're gonna conduct ourselves from here on out. We can't go back to normal. That's how we got here where we are today. And I think it's a symbiotic relationship the way that I see it. We need to be working with the county government, the state government, and even at the federal level to combat the issue that is climate change. Uh, Ms. Rooley. Every time I hear the word sea level rise, that I learned that, I don't know, maybe since Al Gore to now, I think about, there was a magazine called Cosmopolitan, and the front of the magazine said, like, how to marry a millionaire, how to marry the guy of your dreams. You run to the page number 30th, and you're looking for one, two, three, and four, but you don't see anything that you can actually put in place to make that a reality. So that's what sounds to me when I hear everybody talking about sea level rises. Let's kick the can, but we're going to say, and we're going to do, but I said, how long is going to take? It's a 30-year plan. We're going to stop the hurricanes from coming to Miami. We are not. All we can do is hope that our commissioners and the city leaders will not dilapidate our finances for when we need it, we have it there to drive the sewer pipes. Thanks. All right. Um, thank you all very much. Uh, let me do uh, one last question for me, and then we'll transition to audience questions. Um, and this one is for Mr. Uh, Valdez Valdez. Uh, one of the challenges facing the Miracle Mile is parking. In order for customers to get to businesses, they need to either park and walk or get to the mile some other way. Uh, would you favor increasing the supply of parking spots, expanding the freebie system, or extending the trolley schedule to run seven days a week instead of five? I would do all three of those. I think Miracle Mile, the, the beauty of shopping that we're all used to is parking right in front of a store, running in, getting what you need, and, and coming out. I think we need the, the freebie needs to be expanded. The trolley needs to be expanded. And I have a problem with the whole parking situation on Miracle Mile and what they're doing on Miracle Mile, which I frankly do not agree with and have not agreed with. I think the situation needs to be resolved that people can be, how are you gonna get people from the parking decks into the stores is what I wanna know. How are you gonna get them from, you know, to walk a thousand steps from in the heat of the day to go around the alley to try to get into the stores? I think it's ludicrous. I think we need to figure out a way to get more parking on the mile. Ms. Anderson. I agree that we need um, both the freebie, the trolley, and in the parking garages, um, a stationary freebie, not necessarily straight, I would call it a circulating freebie, so that people can readily go from the parking garage directly to the store that they want to go to. And as we design uh, new buildings that are coming in, we need to provide uh, cut-throughs or paseos for people to go from the parking garage if they choose to walk directly onto the mile instead of having to go through an alley onto Lejeune Road or another busy highway to get there. I think better planning, we can have a wonderful system where people in the parking garage can reserve a spot, there'll be adequate parking there, and there'll be a freebie downstairs that they can take directly to where they wanna go. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Ms. cruz -Menes. I absolutely agree that we should expand the trolley service and the freebie service, including into our residential neighborhoods when possible. And as for the garages and parking, yes, we need them, but we also need to renovate those garages that we have. And they should be smart garages, garages that allow us through technology to know um, on an app perhaps, perhaps whether how many spaces are in a specific parking garage, where they can be located, et cetera. We need to make things as okay. easy as possible for people. And I agree with Ms. Anderson's idea. That was something I was thinking about as well. During the current, current climate, can we use the freebie as a way to transport people between garages to their destination? But right now, this is something that we have to invest time in. Um, the Floridian mentality is not one to abandon their cars. I grew up up north, so I grew up walking in the heat and in the cold, but people over here don't. And so there is a transition process. And as people move to downtown, we need to make sure there are near, nearby uh, businesses that they can frequent. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Hack. I as well would see to the utilization of all three. I am a big proponent in public transportation and think that the trolley and the freebie routes should be expanded. I as well believe that in the upgrading and the changing of the parking garages to accommodate for more cars, if we are ho hopeful, hoping to get more people inside of, our, inside of Miracle Mile's stores. I'm also believing in, I also believe in giving our residences a choice and that if we are to give them a choice. I think a type of grace period should be allowed on street parking. And while the streetscape, the, the streetscaping of Miracle Mile did do a lot to reduce parking on the street, I still believe that there should be some level of convenience and a choice for our residents to walk into a store with ease and be able to spend as much time as they want. Thank you. Ms. Jolie. Well, which is it? We have to keep distance. We have to wear masks. For now, we have to have more trolleys in which we have to have more people transporting together to go to our destinations. We have to make up our minds, people. People want to get out of their house, get in their cars, go to the store, park close by, but wait, you know, Miracle Mile, the, you know, the leaders already do their way with the parking. So now we're just gonna have to go around and try to find a parking spot where we can just go uh, to the bridal shop. We are not gonna resolve the parking problem because if resolving the parking problem means that we have to have more buildings in Miracle Mile, you're just gonna make the problem worse. If we don't have a solution for what we have now, we have to leave it alone. People are not gonna walk. What we're gonna do is make people more adamant to be looking for a parking space to then go to a store in Miracle Mile. And that's my angle. Ms. Miro. Thank you. Um, I, I believe that if we are going to revitalize Miracle Mile, that we definitely need to expand each one of those, the trolley, the freebie, and, and also parking. I agree with my colleagues and the ideas that they've shared as well, as far as making it uh, garages smart so that we know um, what's available. We, I also have an app on our phone and know, hey, this is the parking garage that has you know, most available spaces. I also think that we have to take into consideration the weather. So definitely having a shuttle, whether that's the freebie or not, getting everybody to, um, to Miracle Mile, to the stores, to the restaurants that they wanna go to, those are all very necessary things that we need to do. And these are conversations that need to be had and uh, looked at. A lot of residents have shared with me that they would like the trolley service to be expanded. So we need to look into doing that as well, seven days a week, um, if possible. Anything that we can do to help revitalize Miracle Mile um, by way of the parking and making it more accessible is, uh, is a step in the right direction. Thank you. All right, thank you all very much. Uh, the next question is from our audience, and we will begin with Ms. Anderson. How will you address the needs of the senior population in the Gables? The senior population has uh, many challenges. Uh, one, you know, is accessibility and being able to get from places. You have 
crosswalk issues where you don't have enough time to, to cross the, the street itself. All of those lights need to allow more time for folks. Other senior issues, and it was a very broad question, uh, dealing with uh, being able to uh, have sufficient disabled parking available, being able to get into the stores uh, near the curbside with marked spaces, and having recreational facilities available, which we do have a recreational facility, eventually we'll be able to open it up, but uh, I would be very responsive to issues of the seniors as they come forward. Um, as far as, uh, is the time up, did you say? Oh, time. Hmm. Okay, and as far as what the city is doing now, uh, taking care of our seniors who need um, COVID shots, et cetera, Things like that we need to constantly do, whether we have a hurricane come around, we check on our seniors, and now my time is up. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Cruz Jimenez, the needs of the senior population. The issue of accessibility, particularly now, I think is one that, um, that we really need to confront for seniors. You know, first beginning with the trolley, I know that it's difficult for a number of them to step up. So we need to look at trolleys that actually have a, a, a flat lower platform for them to enter. But beyond that, Mr. Hawk has actually shined the light on ADA compliant issues. And these apply to people with disabilities as well as to the elderly. And so we really need to look at our, our infrastructure and, is, and how friendly it is. And beyond that, as we're thinking about aging, we are entering into a new um, culture. And the old culture, people were dying at about 60 or 70, but now people are retiring at 65 and some of them are starting a new life at 70. In fact, we're trying to attract them here. And so we need to re-envision our entire society to allow for these individuals to lead a comfortable and prosperous life well into their 80s and 90s if possible. Thank you. Mr. Hack. Ms. Cruz Jimenez. Um, but that was uh, in no small, that was in collaboration with my campaign manager, Samantha Duran. She opened my eyes to the needs of not only disabled people within the community, but in, uh, uh, in addition, also the, the elderly population in Coral Gables. Although the median age of, in Coral Gables is 39 years old, there is no doubt that the elderly are just as important in our community. When I was in my, when I was a, a, a young child, I did service hours for the STARS, which was a group of elderly residents in Coral Gables that attended the Church of the Little Flower. And it was there that I also began, began to get closer to these people and really understand that a lot of them don't have people to take care of them. And I really made it a mission to not only address elderly needs, but in conjunction, disabled needs and partnering with Ms. Duran has been a great asset. Thank you. Ms. Jolie. To know what a senior needs, you either have to be in contact with a senior or have one of your parents that you need to help. My dad is 91. My mom is in her 70s. And I take care of all their needs. But you know what seniors need the most? Companionship. They don't need to go to Miracle Mile. They don't need to go transfer to anywhere. They don't want to go anywhere. It's already too cold. It's too hot. They need a companion. How can we achieve that as a commission? We have a dedicated line of people that will, they will call and we will pick them up to go to Costco, or to go to Miracle Mile, or to go back home. Forget this. They don't want to have a smart car. They don't want to look at their apps to see where there is a parking so they can go. They hardly can get out of their houses. They have somebody pushing them through Granada to go across the street. I am a very active in the Church of Little Flower and elder people go to the 530 mass. They all love me and they tell me exactly what they need. Uh, Ms. Miro. Thank you. I've had the opportunity to knock on several doors during my campaign and I can't tell you how surprised I am at how many residents we have in the city of Coral Gables over the age of 95, not just 90, 95. 
And I think that there is this huge misconception that if you live in Coral Gables, everyone who lives in Coral Gables were filthy rich or super affluent. And that is not true. A lot of these people that are seniors that are over 90 years old bought their houses in the Gables many, many years ago. They got in when it was affordable to them. And now they're, they're struggling to pay their taxes. They're on fixed incomes. And I really think that we can help them a little more they would benefit from a hot meals, a home delivery program. A lot of them, that would be one less meal for them to, um, to have to come out of their pocket. Not only that, but a senior center. I think, an, I, I know we have something, but I think we could do something more once COVID is over, a senior center for them to be active in. And lastly, um, the COVID vaccine, helping them with online services, like getting in line for the vaccine would be something that I would definitely look into. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Vadas Fowler. Well, the elderly are our treasure. We were taught as Latins that, you know, we took care of our elderly and loved them and took care of them. One of the things that, just to not get into a lot of it, but one of the biggest problems for the elderly right now is sidewalks. There's no sidewalks. And you see some people walking in their wheelchairs or moving their wheelchairs, and they have to go out in the street because the next two houses don't have sidewalks. I also visited a lot of the elderly and one gentleman in particular had a humongous tree that had ripped up his sidewalk and the sidewalk was completely out and he couldn't walk from his car to his house because of the sidewalk. But we were more concerned about the beauty of the tree than the life safety issue of this poor gentleman falling down. I think we need to address the sidewalks among other things, but I think primarily we need to address the sidewalks. Somebody was very concerned about uh, bicycle paths, but I mean, come on. We need to work on sidewalks, not bicycle paths. All right, thank you all. Uh, we will now transition to closing statements. Uh, you have 60 seconds each. We're gonna, going to go in reverse order of the, uh, our opening statements. Uh, so we will begin with uh, uh, Mr. Um, Valley. thank you. I think I am uniquely qualified and to bring a whole different perspective to the commission. I think the commission needs someone with business experience, successful business experience and financial knowledge to help in the commission. I'm not there to change or criticize or whatever. I'm there to add a different layer to the commission to which I think is sorely needed. I have gotten endorsements from many, many groups already and more are coming to, because I am, I am a listener and I have also been a team player in the community, not just in Coral Gables, but in the county to listen. And I think we need to play, make sure that Coral Gables is a player and not its own little silo in the community. The Miami-Dade Democrat Club has endorsed me, Coral Gables Democratic Club has endorsed me, Victory Club has endorsed me, among many others that are, that are all coming. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Miro. Thank you. I feel it's very important that the commission reflects the community it represents, and I would like to see myself reflected on the dais. I would like to see myself as a woman, as a single mom, as a proud member of the working force, uh, being represented there. I am just like you. I am a resident who happens to be a candidate, not a candidate who happens to be a resident. I think like you, I have the same concerns that you do. Um, I'm not um, tied to any political, uh, any political affiliations or political dynasties. And I think that's important because moving forward, um, seeing the changes that we've seen happen to our, our beautiful city in the last four years, we cannot continue to have the Fox watching over the hen house. I think that it's important that we elect leaders and having experienced 20 years in public sector, I'm uniquely qualified because I know how to get the job done. I have the relationships, especially now with COVID, you need somebody who can go to Tallahassee, who can bargain for the city and make sure, fight for it, the best um, benefit and outcome for the city of Coral Gables. Thank you. Ms. Jolie. Um, Um, we really don't have to have the whole city of Coral Gables represented in the commission. We have to have somebody who will speak for the residents. 
And for that, you have to have the feeling and the love for that community. Even if you pick number 76, or if you don't, the commissioners are not gonna get rid of me. I'm gonna be there fighting for you. I'm gonna be your voice, even they like it or not, because this is my home. And I became to love America, I'm an advocate, I am a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a sister, I'm an employer, I'm an American. And as an American, I'm living in one of the best neighborhood of the world, growing my family and enjoying the quality of life that Coral Gable offers. That's why I am gonna be your voice. Number 76, because it's maybe 70, 76 again, and I am gonna be there for you. Mr. Hack. I've been a lifelong resident of Coral Gables. I've gone to school locally at St. Teresa's School as well as the University of Miami. As I have met residents while knocking on doors and I have asked them what are their concerns for the city of Coral Gables, they'll usually, without knowing, say things related to my platform, development, parking, housing, among other things. And it's that, it's, it's that unique connection, I believe, that my platform is for the community and of the community, and it is bringing those fresh ideas and that dynamic personality to the commission that I think we'll see the biggest bang for our buck if we bring in those working families and those young professionals and we update our system for the 21st century and for a post-COVID world. And that is where I stand as a candidate, and that is who I am. Ms. Cruz Jimenez. Again, thank you. Like in 1925, when George Merrick founded our city beautiful, we have entered into a new economy, one in which technology, mobility, and sustainability will be at the forefront. What we do from this moment on must respect our city's unique history, but it also the plan must adapt to 21st century challenges. So what does that mean? Architecture and design should have a lot of open spaces to allow people to gather. Again, more pedestrian activity, tree canopies to promote it, outdoor dining, making those um, outdoor seating permits, permits permanent and finding cost-effective ways to get people outside during the summer months. But most importantly, if we are to have a prosperous future well into the 21st century, we need to work together, united, to forge a new vision and a plan. Thank you. Ms. Anderson. My passion to improve Coral Gables didn't start when this race began. It began 16 years ago when my children were endangered on a very busy street. Every project that came in my neighborhood, I put my hand up and I participated in. I made the time for 16 years to do this. Despite working, despite having children, I made the time. And as my pastor told me one time, give a busy person a task to do and they will find a way to do it. I will be there as I've always been there for the past 16 years. I've canvassed my neighbors, I know their views, and I don't have a single dollar of developer money that I've received. I'm doing this for the residents, and I'll be there for the residents, and I'm committed to doing what the residents want and listening, as I always have for the past 16 years. Thank you. And thank you all. Uh, now how about a round of applause for our candidates? And I would like to welcome the second group of candidates for uh, uh, a seat on the city commission. Uh, we have with us tonight, Javier Baños, Alex Buccello, Buccello um, Kirk Menendez, and PJ Mitchell. And uh, I have an update. All four of these candidates have signed the, uh, the positive campaign pledge. So I look forward to a happy and congenial debate. Very well. Um, so let's, let's jump right into it. Um, we will uh, begin with prepared remarks. 
Um, and uh, beginning with Mr. Banos and then proceeding from there. Push it, push it forward. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll stand up if you want. Does it happen now? Appreciate it. Uh, sorry, my, my mic was not seem to be working, so I'll, I'll do it standing up for a moment. Uh, so once again, my name is Javier Baños. Um, for the past 11 years, I've had the pleasure to live in this wonderful city. Uh, the, the, the most important voter we have, which is my wife, which is sitting up there, uh, uh, with, uh, without whose support, I would not be able to do this. Uh, my children, um, Amelia and Lorenzo, who are the, life, uh, the soul of my life, uh, as well with my hero, my father, who's standing up there, who was bright enough to bring me to this country when I was 11 years old, uh, and uh, who gave me the fortitude and, and um, the values that I think are important as a, as a, as a, as a naturalized American uh, to live in this wonderful country. For me, uh, public service is a calling. It's something that I think if we demand a government we deserve, we should have that, uh, that, that particular government. I have made it my mission as a certified public accountant and as an attorney to live up to those expectations. I've served over 15 years in various boards, including in the, in the city of Cora Gables uh, Retirement Board. And as I've walked the city for the past uh, year, uh, uh, I want to serve the residents of Cora Gables uh, as, uh, to, to fix some of the main, major problems that we have. I welcome your questions. I want to have an opportunity to meet my neighbors and to make everyone here, I wish all of you a very good luck tonight. I know it's very difficult. It's not as much luck to win against me, but, uh, but uh, anyway, thank you very much. And I appreciate the time today. Thank you, Mr. Brusella. Thank you. First of all, I wanna thank the chamber for hosting us here today and you as well, giving us this platform to talk in person for the first time has been absolutely incredible. We're remaining social distance. My name is Alex Pusello, and as many of you know, I'm a lifelong resident of this beautiful city. I've had the pleasure of being born and raised in Core Gables. Residents always ask me, why is it that I'm running? And I find the question and answer quite simple. I want my generation and the generations to come to, to have the same quality of life that I grew up with in Core Gables, not just my generation, my kids and their kids' kids. This city has done a lot for me, and, it's, and quite frankly, I want to serve the city back. I come from a family of service. I've, I myself have had the pleasure of serving on the code enforcement bound for a number of years. I've served this city in and out weekends, um, week, weekdays, and quite frankly, getting to know the neighbors. I've had the, <clears throat> I'm also a practicing litigation attorney. And I can promise you one thing. My time as a, as a litigator, I know what it is to advocate for a client. And having come to know the residents of Coral Gables, I will advocate for every single resident in the city of Coral Gables. In my time speaking with thousands of residents, I've, I've starting last three months, I know the issues and the concerns the residents face. I know, I, I, I can promise you one thing, I, I'm their voice and once elected, I'm the representation of, this, of the residents of four years. I'll make this city an even better place than whatever it is today. Thank you. Mr. Menendez. I'm Kirk Menendez, a lifelong resident of Coral Gables since 1962, and a proud graduate of Coral Gables Senior High School class of 1980, and a member of the 1980 state soccer championship team. Most people know me from my half century relationship with the Coral Gables Youth Center where I grew up, where I coached for over 25 years, and where today I'm the longest serving president of the Coral Gables War Memorial Youth Center Association since the World War II era. I'm running for commissioner as a direct result of our city's legacy of service. I am blessed to have grown up in a time in Coral Gables when everyone knew each other, when everyone helped each other. As someone who lost his dad at the age of 10, I grew up at the youth center where the community rallied around me and my mother and showed us the wonders 
of growing up and living in our city beautiful. When I was in high school, I decided to join that legacy of service by giving back to children and families, and I've never looked back. I also bring extensive experience in government affairs, having worked for nearly a decade advocating in Tallahassee and Washington, D.C. to help pass legislation and bring much needed funding for the benefit of South Florida, and especially those in need. Today, I'm running for my kids, your kids and grandkids, so that they too can grow up and one day raise their own family in the type of community we all grew up in, a community they can be proud of, a community they can all call home. Mr. Mitchell. Good evening, everyone. I um, first wanna say, wanna thank the University of Miami. I wanna thank Mark Trowbridge and all the staff here at uh, the chamber. I wanna thank the other candidates that are here. And I wanna commend each and every one of you. Y'all have all worked hard, you're all professionals. And it's very hard to come up here and do this. Um, there are several issues that are driving me to run. Um, let me tell you first a little bit about myself. I've been uh, here for about 20 years. I'm a practicing lawyer as well, just like these other gentlemen. I'm a lit litigator as well. I've dedicated my time to this community. I've served on several boards, both with the city as well as at the chamber. I've also established my own 5K run. This would have been the seventh year that we would have had it. We would have had it but for the coronavirus. We do our best to make this community better. I think we all do. That's, what, that's why we're here. That's why you're here. I do have some concerns though. And some of my concerns is special interests, significant relationships with other, other municipalities. Those are my concerns. And I'm gonna to pledge to you that once elected, I'm gonna fight for each and every one of you, that there's not gonna be any special interests that are gonna affect me at all. And I can pledge to you that I'm gonna be open, I'm gonna be honest, and I'm gonna treat you just like every one of my clients. I'm gonna fight for you, and I'm gonna do the, I'm gonna fight for the best interests of our community and no one other's interests. All right, thank you all. Uh, the, the first question is addressed to Mr. Brusello. Uh, ideally, a campaign is a conversation in which uh, voters learn about their candidates but also it's an opportunity for candidates to learn about voters. Uh, you've been campaigning now for several weeks. What have you learned about Coral Gables and its residents that you didn't know when you began your campaign? That's a great question. I, I have been campaigning now for nearly four months and I have been, I've had the pleasure of talking to at least 2,000 to 3,000 residents in my, my time walking and knocking on door to door. And it's funny, the first thing that you realize when you, when you knock on a door is, you know, I'm, I'm Alex Vassola, I'm running for Coral Gables Commission. They go, I, I wanna be heard. I have a couple of issues I wanna bring forth. And quite frankly, when, when talking to the residents, these issues, these issues are the following. Number one on their list is that of um, development. Development and traffic are almost 90% of the time the first issues that come out of the residents' mouths. And quite frankly, I think when looking at development and traffic, you have to look at, the city needs smart and controlled development. People ask me and the residents ask me, what is smart and controlled development? And I think the answer to that is maintaining its current height, zone, um, height and density that the zoning calls for as of today, but also allowing for the live, work and play mixed use development. And I think when you talk about mixed use and so on and so forth, I think you're looking at a myriad of things. One is um, environmental resiliency and, and, and walkability. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Menendez. Yes, um, as I've spoken with the residents, uh, I've been fortunate enough to know almost in every block I've walked, uh, I've known a family or two uh, through my years at the youth center. But what I've discovered is that a lot of residents feel left out of the process. They feel like they don't belong anymore to, uh, to how we decide things. Um, they feel that their voice is not being heard. Um, I think also that they're, they feel they're exhausted of the toxicity, they're exhausted of the divisiveness. I think as city government, we need to make sure everyone has a voice and make sure they're part of the process from the beginning, not at the end when a commission's gonna make a final vote. And if that means expanding our notice, uh, public notice 
further across the city, then we should do that. But we should find ways to bring each other together instead of finding ways constantly to divide us as a community. Mr. Mitchell. Well, there's a uh, myriad of issues, um, let me just say, but um, I'm going to tell you about an experience or two that, that I've had. I do have limited time, but every morning I go out running and I see the same, the same group of men and ladies out there walking and running. And I live in the North Gables. And I can tell you from knocking on doors and having the conversations with my neighbors, they're very concerned about the overdevelopment issue. I live right off Ponce. A lot of these decisions that the commission's making, it, it, it personally it directly affects me. It, it, it affects my, my residents that we live in the same neighborhood. They have a lot of concerns. They're concerned about a 17 story building that may go up, or they're concerned about the excess of use of traffic and what's, what may happen. You know, we live a peaceful life and most of the residents, they wanna keep it that way. I started running uh, January of last year. Uh, it's been now over a year that I've been able to talk to residents, over 6,000 homes that have knocked their, 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 their doors. What I've learned is that they're tired, they're angry, they're frustrated. They're feeling that they're losing the city that they love. They feel that they're losing the reason they moved to Cora Gables. Uh, there's a great deal of a disconnect between their residents and their government. They don't feel that the government that they have is a government that they, have, they, they would like to, to expect. The development is out of scale with our res residents. The, uh, the our respect that we should have for the Mediterranean look of our city has been lost. The art in public places that we have doesn't meet the, the, the goals of the city and the, uh, and the traffic is choking the life out of this community. That's what I've learned. And that's what I would like to do as a, as, as a commissioner to answer those concerns and give a voice to that frustration. All right, thank you all. Uh, the next question is addressed first to Mr. Menendez. The Coral Gables Youth Center currently sponsors a range of youth sports. For young players, there tend to be amateur coaches and plenty of local competition. As players get older, they hire professional coaches and travel coaches and travel farther, including tournaments out of state. Would you support scholarships from the city to ensure that low and middle income children can continue to participate in youth sports throughout high school? Absolutely. Um, I helped create a scholarship program for low income children uh, in unison with the area public schools so that they can attend our summer camps, which is about $2,000 per child. So every year between the city and the War Memorial Youth Center Association, we've been giving out 10 full scholarships. And I'd like to expand upon that. Um, the youth center has a history of kids that range all from low income to middle income to wealthy families. It should be inclusive. There's no way that we should allow any child or any family to feel left out because financially they can't. I think with all the development that we have, with all the business that we have, we need to find a way to funnel some of that money to help our low-income families, the ones that are struggling, to make sure no child is left out. Thank you. Mr. Mitchell. The answer is yes, but I think we should do it in a different way. I think we should use a private and public partnership, and that's how we can accomplish those goals. Actually, we can do that with other issues here in the city as well. You know, I'm, I'm president-elect of the Coral Gables Bar Association this year. And we, each year we give approximately four or five scholarships out to local kids from the Coral Gables High School. So absolutely, we need to continue those opportunities for these young minds because they're the future. They're the future Coral Gables. They're the future of our country. I am a, I believe that private, the civil society has a big significant place in shaping the government and the life that we lead. Uh, I, if we have a system such as, for example, I'm a, I'm a proud Knight of Columbus, and the Knight of Columbus uh, have put together significant funds to, to help youth sports, to, put to, to, to organize fairs, 
to make sure that if children, not only in this community, but children who in the broader community actually are able to have the life that we ha have been fortunate enough to, to receive and to have. I think youth sports is essential. I will definitely be a, a huge supporter of, of that position. I will use the leadership of Mr. Menendez uh, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the board that he, that he leads, uh, which I believe it's, uh, uh, and it's, I think it's an important part of, of bringing children and, and fixing the, uh, and giving um, the next generation their due. Mr. Brissett. The answer is absolutely. And I myself had the pleasure of being appointed to the Youth Center War Memorial Board by Mr. Kirk Menendez some time ago. So I understand what, what the Youth Center brings both in sports and for children. My, I myself spent countless summers in summer camp playing baseball, basketball, football, you name it. I spent every, almost every day in and out of the Youth Center. So the answer is absolutely. And I think it tapers into, quite frankly, what I stand for was just the quality of life, not just for our generation, but future generations. I think Coral Gables is, is that's the main focus of Coral Gables. And I think whether you're young, Whatever financial capabilities you have, I think the youth center is an asset and sports is an asset and I would absolutely endorse such policies. Thank you. All right, thank you all very much. <clears throat> the next question is addressed first to uh, Mr. Mitchell. And it is, please address your ideas to ensure greater safety around the Granada golf course, especially for walkers. Uh, okay. Um, I'm an active runner. I've been around the uh, golf course multiple times and almost have gotten hit by a golf ball once or twice. Um, and I know other residents that actually have been hit by a golf ball. Notwithstanding that, look, I think there's an opportunity there around the golf course for us to go ahead and uh, establish a, a running lane on the exterior of the, um, um, of the walk path there. Um, I think that that's a real opportunity. I think that, you know, when the golfers are out there and when the runners are out there and there's a lot of foot traffic in that particular area, we all have to be mindful of that activity. And so what we have to do is further educate the other residents on, on how to take necessary precautions. But I, I do believe that there's an opportunity for a, for a running path in that particular area. It's, uh... I live at 1801 Casillas Street. I walk the golf course every single morning with my wife. Uh, and uh, specifically on the southern part of the, of the golf, Granada Golf Course, uh, uh, as you pass Coral Way, it's a muddy mess uh, and it should be completely fixed. We should have a, a sidewalk in that area as Major, uh, former Mayor, Mayor Kaysen uh, had proposed uh, during his mayoralty. Uh, I think safety is a significant concern uh, for, for, the, for the area, but the reality today is that folks walk that, that, that area every single day and they do it at their peril. I think the sidewalk in the southern end is, is essential. I think a walking path in the periphery is, it will, will be ideal and we would have to curtail uh, the, the impact that golfers may have on, on, the, uh, on the residents and I will welcome the input of everyone who's a resident there, who's a walker there to figure out a compromise to make sure that everyone has their due. Mr. Russello. I myself had the pleasure of being born and raised in South Greenway. So I do, I myself growing, growing up spent countless hours walking and enjoying the green space of the greenways and the Granada golf course. But with that being said, I think when we talk about safety of the residents, that is the utmost importance. But I do think that when, when, when it comes to whether or not we have a bike lane, running lane, or whatever the case is, I think we need resident involvement. I think that is the most important. I think we need to hear from the residents that quite frankly use the, the Granada golf course for, for exercise as one uses as running, biking, golfing, whatever the case may be, and the neighbors and the residents that live on the Granada Golf Course. I think we need to hear from them and how, what we can do as a city to improve the green space there. Thank you. Mr. Menendez. Tragically, um, someone lost their life on the Granada Golf Course not that long ago. A jogger was hit by a bicyclist and, and hit her head on the pavement and passed away. Um, it's a mess. Uh, you have on the street, joggers, bicyclists, drivers, folks looking for their golf balls. Uh, I agree, the first thing we need to do is have a workshop with the North Greenway and South Greenway Drive residents to find uh, A, what the issues are, the problems from their perspective and work with them for a solution. 
we need to bring City Hall to the community. Um, some neighbors are talking about a safe zone, about lowering the speed around the golf course, even including bicyclists. I think we need a comprehensive plan, and of late, all we seem to do is find band-aids for the problem. And I think it needs to be comprehensive, and we need to organize how we're going to address and how we're going to keep everyone safe at the Granada Golf Course. All right, thank you all very much. Uh, the next question is addressed to Mr. Um, Banos. Several civic groups recently signed a letter to the city commission criticizing the process used to develop the new zoning code due to a uh, perceived lack of transparency. How do you ensure Gables residents have ample input during the development stages of future projects? We're bringing them in, which I think was lacking in this particular debate. It was a long process that took place before we got to the October 1st hearing on, uh, on that particular project. The problem that you have is that most of that was done without the broader community being in. There are several community leaders that represent various groups. Their input is essential so that the misimpression that may be created, because I think Mike Mena and, uh, and Commissioner Force, who are present here, as well as Commissioner Lago, I think they're well-meaning people. Okay? They have, we may disagree with them, but ultimately, they do have the, the best interests of the city uh, at hand. And what, what ultimately occurs is that if you don't, if you don't give folks a vision, you don't bring people in, you don't give them a sense of what they're gonna, is going to be done, and you just, bring, if you just throw the, the, the debate in front of them, uh, I think that's where you get the miscommunication. That's where you get the, la the, the lack of understanding from some, of the res from some of the residents. And that is a great deal of what happened, to happened to today. There are too many outside influences in City Hall, and we need to stop that from happening. Mr. Brusello. When you speak of transparency, and you asked me earlier, what are the issues that the residents are, are most aware of? And quite frankly, when you're knocking on, when I've been knocking on door to door, that's one of the issues that they say, that development and quite frankly, transparency. Um, they just, the residents just want to be heard. I think current administration um, and prior administration have done a great job in being transparent, given these, given all the, the issues going on currently in the city of Coral Gables. They've held several public meetings. I think there's definitely room to engage more of the citizens. I think moving forward, we need to make a better effort to get the, the, the word out that there is these meetings being held, not just for the the, 10, the 100, 200 residents that are always involved. We need to have, at a, we need to have the residential involvement at a greater scale. And quite frankly, moving forward, if elected, I want to I want to make that a priority and have an open door policy and quite frankly, be the voice in the and for the residents that are elected. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Menendez. It's what I alluded to in my opening statement, the process. Um, the residents are late to the game quite often, and uh, we need to find a way, I believe, of expanding the radius of public notice. I strongly believe that any development project of a certain scale, we should make sure that the radius of public notice is expanded much further than it is today. I also believe that should be applied to anything having to do with historic preservation. Um, we need to make sure that all residents have a seat at the table. And unfortunately, um, that has created a division within our community. We need to come together. And by coming together, we need transparency and we need to make sure everyone is part of the solutions and everyone is part of the process. So I believe in expanding the radius of public notice to bring our residents back into the fold. Mr. Mitchell. Well, the other candidates are right, it's notice. But the question is, how do you communicate that notice? I mean, look, we all, we've all gotten a notice when there's a project that's um, gonna break ground within a certain radius of our home. That notice itself for, for most average lay people, it's very hard to understand. It's, it's almost in another language. And absent any type of formal training, the average person wouldn't be able to understand that. Now, let me just address the issue here in terms of the meetings. You know, they had over 25 meetings. These commissioners work hard every single day. They love this community. They do the best that they can. Again, the way that they communicate the notice is the issue. I don't think so much it's the number of meetings. It's how we communicate that notice. That's the issue that we have to resolve. 
All right, thank you all. Uh, the next question is addressed uh, first to Mr. Uh, Brusello, and it is, what are your ideas to improve the residential construction permitting process? That's another issue that's always addressed when knocking door to door. I think we've made great leaps and as to the permitting process. I myself hear a lot of complaints from residents while my time in the code enforcement board, they quite frankly take the violation over overseeing, overseeing the, the process through. But quite frankly, I think there's much, much room to, to, to streamline the process. And with the technology given today, I think it's something that is readily available. I know the prior group was talking a little bit about it. We have to make great leaps with the technology available now and make it much more streamlined and effective. Both, I think, by doing so, it will aid in cost-effective, paper-effective, and all these sorts of, sort of sort of things. But I think it's definitely something that needs to be addressed, needs to be up-to-date and brought into the 21st century. Thank you. Mr. Menendez. I think, without a doubt, um, despite all the improvements that the city is, um, try to make with regards to the permitting, that's one of the number one concerns and issues among the residents that I've spoken to. I think, uh, I know there's old school, but there's also new school. I think we need to consider applying online permit permitting real time, just like some schools have, you can track your child's grades in a real time basis. I can go on my phone and see what my son did that day. I think if we have that type of technology where you can track your permit on a real time basis, it eliminates the uncertainty and it adds greater improvement in the predictability. And I think that would help greatly quell a lot of the concerns and frustrations in the, our residents. Mr. Mitchell. I'm sure we've all had uh, certain experiences with the permitting process. I can, I can tell you that I just recently had a, an issue myself. I, I had submitted an application to have my home painted and it took me over three months to get my own home painted and it was a pre-approved color. I, I had to CC Commissioner Fours on the email before they would issue my, my permit to paint my own home. So I, I, I agree, I agree with you. We do need fully integrated online process. And actually I, I, I believe that when it comes to things like painting your home, some of that should just be automatic same day. That would solve a lot of the issues and, and so that the city can actually focus on some of the bigger permitting issues. This is a staff problem, a technology problem, a, a budgeting problem uh, that the city has. It took me a year to build a wall on the side of my house, a retaining wall, so my children would be protected from the uh, oversized, uh, from the traffic that happens on Madeira. That shouldn't be the case. But it's a reality on many of the thousands of homes that, I, that, I, that I've gone to. The city has, to the, to the leadership of the current commission, has moved or will be moving in a, in a, in a very uh, quick uh, process into an automatic system, which will help. But the Board of Architects tends to be a bottleneck. Uh, the lack of staffing, the, the double bureaucracy, because I believe my, personally we have too many managers in that, in that particular department. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge bottleneck. And the fact that some special interests get the, their particular friends within the staff, nothing to do with the commission, uh, to actually promote their particular projects versus the projects of regular residents. Regular residents are the taxpayers. Regular residents should be the people who are heard and should be both attended first. All right, thank you very much. Um, next question is to Mr. Menendez. Um, and it is, what will be your likely first piece of legislation uh, that you will introduce as a new city commissioner if you are elected? Um, well, it goes back to um, what I said about transparency in the process. Um, my second is sustainability and septic tanks issue, but I think the biggest concern though, that is a vital and key concern uh, with sea level rise. I think transparency and the process. So my res, I would try to pass legislation that modifies our the way the city goes by goes about communicating with and notifying the residents. I like I said earlier, not only expand the radius of notices, but I think you know there are neighborhood associations out there that represent a large number of uh, residents. 
And I think we need to find a way, a creative way, think out of the box, how we can effectively, effectively notify everyone as to what's going on in city government. It shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't be a secret. It should be something out in the open and we need to bring everybody to be part of the process. Mr. Mitchell, your first act as a uh, commissioner. Well, considering the situation that we are in right now with COVID, first thing I wanna focus on is small businesses. I wanna re-energize them. I'm gonna call on this mayor of the city of Coral Gables right now to rescind the uh, curfew. I also wanna call on the mayor to allow these restaurants to stay open. I've got a friend of mine, she owns a restaurant right there on there at 230 Miracle Mile. You know, she's having to cut her, her employees loose. Those, those employees aren't making a good living. They can't pay their bills. And the owner of the restaurant is doing everything that she can to keep everything together so she can keep those employees. It's a, it's a major issue. And when, when we have a situation like that, we need to address that first. Uh, Mr. Hard to pick, I have like 30 of them. Uh, but you know, I, I think fixing the Met bonus uh, as Com uh, Commissioner Mena has proposed, it's a, it's a, it's a major priority. I think as, as, Com as Mr. Menendez said, transparency and bringing folks into, 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 into uh, City Hall is essential. For me, a primary issue has to be modifying and um, uh, our pension system so that we can uh, close off part of the plan uh, to non-police and fire employees and try to mitigate that particular loss. And lastly, it has to be, uh, if, if, I, if I can, uh, bring in the, the, the sea level rise because if you, if you talk to the folks in Gables by the sea, you talk to the folks that are near the, the, the water, that's a primary issue. It's a life of death issue for the next 20 years for them. And it will have a huge impact on our property values. Most of our money, or a significant portion of residential monies that come into the city comes from areas that are near the water. And that will be a significant problem that we have to address right away. Mr. Brusello. I think the first piece of legislation I would enact is, has to do with what we're seeing lately in the lately in Core Gables, and that is of Miracle Mile, downtown Core Gables, and retail space as we know it. I think we've seen COVID-19 the last year and, has a, how, and how it's affected retail space. People are scared to go out for, for the right reasons, They're for life safety issues. And more importantly, retail space is forever changing from the likes of Amazon. So I, my first piece of legislation will quite frankly be to have a public-private partnership. We need to hear from the small businesses. We need to know what they need and how we can work together to bring businesses into downtown Core Gables. I think that is the utmost importance. We, we talk about changing height restrictions and so on and so forth, but what we need to focus on is the small businesses in the downtown Core Gables and how, what we can do to implement to bring more, more shoppers, more retail space, more and less vacancies to the downtown Core Gables and have the city of Core Gables be a vibrant downtown. All right, our next question is from the audience, uh, beginning with Mr. Mitchell. As an elected official, do you believe it is your job to do what the majority of residents want you to do, even if you don't personally believe it is the right thing for the city? As an elected official, it's my job to look into the best interests of the city and of the community. And there's certain guidelines in my mind that have to tick off. You have to look at any type of legislation that may be prejudicial, how it may impact the residents, how it may impact the actual city. You have to look at the end goal. In my mind, there's an analysis that has that me personally that I look at whenever I evaluate any type of problem, whether it's a legal problem, whether it's just a regular issue. But when we Look at the legislation that's gonna be propounded at the city. We have to take in, most importantly, in my humble opinion, the most prejudicial effect and what is that effect on the residents? Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. I think you, you take your cues and your guidance from the residents, you're their representative. You're not there for the constituency of one of just you. You're there for the constituency of the many. Uh, I would do what I think is in the best interest of the city of, of Cora Gables, but I think in order for you to do what is in the best interest of, this, of the city, you have to make sure 
that you every resident that it, is able to speak with you and you meet with them and you do and you get involved in the actual community that you're trying to represent. You listen to them, you let them guide you, and that should be your that should be the the barometer by which you actually legislate. It should not be a top down approach. It should be a bottom up approach in which the it should naturally flow from the people uh, what what they expect in their government. And that should be the way, I, I, my personal perspective, the government should, should work. If it's illegal, I won't do it, but you know, <laughs> you know, that will be the only, the only parameter. Mr. Brussello. I think it's a balance. I think we have to, quite frankly, as, as, as commissioner and elected or holding a position in elected office, I think we are a representation of the residents that we serve. I think, again, and I go back to having spoken to nearly 2,000 residents, I think they want to be heard. They have their concerns. They have their issues. And I think it's time we start listening to them and giving them a platform. I would 100% do what's right for the city and what's in the best interest of the city. I think that's the utmost importance. But quite frankly, when doing so, I think we need to hear more from the residents. And I think we need to have their, be their voice in the commission and have their input. Thank you. Mr. Menendez. First thing I'll do is tell our city administration when they brief me on agenda items is um, I don't want to hear just the pros. I want to hear the cons. Because no commission member wants to be blindsided by issues that are important that impact our residents in a negative way. So I want to know both sides. And the other thing, instead of waiting for the residents to come to City Hall to ask the questions, I think City Hall needs to go out into the community. We need to do more outreach. And we need to be out there, not in our offices, though obviously, we meet a lot of constituents in that way, but we need to bring different ideas, opposing views, and only by listening to all sides can we make the right decision. That's what community is about. Community is involvement, including everyone, and finding a way to take the right step going forward so we can all move forward in the future and create a hometown that we're proud of. All right, thank you all very much. Uh, we'll now move to closing statements, uh, moving in reverse order from the opening statements. Uh, and so we will begin with um, Mr. Mitchell. Briefly, the residents of the city of Coral Gables has a tough choice. You got some very good candidates up here. Question is, which vision are you going to vote for? I can tell you from my experience that there are a number of issues that we face. The biggest issue right now, besides the overdevelopment, we have to deal with the COVID-19s and, and the full transition. We also have to deal with some of the other issues that were brought up here this evening. But I think you have to really look at the individual. You have to judge the individual as to what they've done. And I can tell you that's normally the best approach. If you look at what somebody's done in the past, you'll be able to see what they're going to do in the future. And unfortunately, you know, we have certain um, influencers out there. And when I say influencers, I'm talking about special interests. So whenever you go make that decision, I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. Who's the candidate that's going to be for the residents? Mr. Menendez. For, no, for nearly 40 years, all I've done is help and serve our community. From my years at Gables High to my years coaching thousands of kids at the youth center, many of whom are Coral Gables moms and dads today. I owe so much to our community, the community I actually truly love. With your help, I can take that next step in the journey, a journey that will see the next generation of Gables kids join us in your legacy of service. Before you can lead, you must learn how to serve. I hope I can count on your support and on your vote this election. Mr. Brusello. I'm gonna reiterate what I said in my opening statements and that is I'm a lifelong resident of this city. I've, I've come to know my neighbors in my, my entire life. And quite frankly, I've served this city for a new, uh, numerous years now. I've had the pleasure of serving on the code enforcement board. I know what it is to work together for the greater good of the city in my time in the code enforcement board. 
I, I've, I've come to know the residents by knocking door to door and knowing what the issues are and what their concerns are. And quite frankly, when elected, I, I, know what imp I know what I need to implement to make this city an even better city than what it already is today. Thank you. Right. Baños. Well, you will have whether Commissioner Baños would be a person who is not influenced by everyone. I've been lucky enough to have my own private business to manage over a hundred other businesses for folks as a CPA, as an, as an attorney. I put my own money in my campaign. I don't have any developer money. I don't owe anyone anything. All I owe is the residents and the citizens of this nature, a great, the great gift that they have given me. Uh, and I wanna give back to this community. It is my duty and my obligation to do so. I see it uh, and I, I think the, this office is a full fruition of that. I will do my darnest to represent you. I will do, I'll be, I'll be your person who will listen to you, will bring the community into the commission. I will be a, a true representative of the people. I'm not there to represent anybody else's. I, uh, I love this city and I wanna be the person that this is city and this government deserves. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you all very much. Please give them a round of applause. We are now ready to begin the panel with a silent audience. All right. Uh, and now to uh, mayoral candidates. Um, I would like to welcome um, our three candidates, uh, Mr. Holmes, Mr. Ms. Keon, and Mr. Lago. Um, I should note that once again, all candidates are bound by the expectation that the void uh, uh, in, injurious or slanderous remarks. Uh, we, actually, we also ask the uh, audience to maintain their silence until the very end. Um, I would note that uh, Ms. Keon and Mr. Lago have also signed the clean, uh, positive campaigning pledge. Um, and we thank them for it. Uh, we'll now move to opening statements, beginning with Mr. Holmes. Okay, I, I, the mic is working, yes? So it's really wonderful to be here. Uh, I wanna thank the Chamber of Commerce at the University of Miami, the Coral Gables uh, Good Government uh, Organization. Um, and um, can somebody uh, verify for me the cameras, the light up there on the top? That's right, there's actually, so there's, a, there's, there's one camera up there up above and then in the middle, there's, there's the two cameras uh, for, for Facebook and the university. Uh, can you point it out to me? Because I want to talk to the audience, but if I don't know where the camera is, I can't do that. Okay, got it now. Um, so I also thank uh, all of you voters. Uh, we're doing everything semi-remotely now. Uh, and uh, I've got my 90 second opening. So I say to you, don't you agree? This is a vote of a lifetime in Coral Gables. Coral Gables as a suburb has already ended, thanks unfortunately to my opponents and, and the other city commissioners voting to open up development in the residential areas. They don't, the, the city commission won't even tell us by how much. Uh, they've already voted uh, in favor of more development in the Northern Crafts section. Uh, Miracle Mile, they took a preliminary vote to take it to four stories. The city of Coral Gables as a suburb is ending before our eyes. We have a chance to, to, to try to prevent that. I ask for your vote. My two opponents, my two opponents already voted for uh, these drastic expansion of development rights. And uh, we're, we're gonna lose our best residents. Uh, thanks so much. We're gonna, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Keon. Now, okay, do I get to start over <laughs> with good evening? <laughs> Thank you, George. Good evening. I'm running for mayor to preserve the high quality of life standards that have kept Coral Gables a most desirable place to live. Maintaining the value of our homes and integrity of our neighborhoods has always been of paramount importance to me. But while COVID-19 remains with us, we must ensure that public health and safety continues to be our priority as restaurants and other businesses resume normal operation. 
We are fortunate to live in Coral Gables. I believe most of us choose to live here because it is a beautiful city and we feel safe in our homes and on our streets. Our police and paramedics are among the best in the nation and we know we can rely on them to respond and be on site within minutes of a call. It has been my job as a commissioner and will be as mayor to make sure that every department has the resources necessary to serve residents at the highest level and to ensure we are either sustaining or enhancing the quality of life that makes Coral Gables, Coral Gables. Why choose me? I have the experience, I have the background, I have the education, and I have the temperament to lead the city with civility and respect to all of our residents, our staff, and all others who come before us. I would be honored to serve as your city's second woman mayor. Thank you, Mr. Lago. Ever since I was elected as commissioner in 2013, a lot of milestones have been accomplished and I have sponsored countless le legislation. If elected mayor, I'm committing to implementing an agenda that aims to not only preserve our city's quality of life, but enhance it. During my first 100 days, I pledged to focus on five main categories, transparency, public service, finance, transportation, and the environment. Governing with integrity, trans transparency, and ensuring government accountability have remained the bedrock of my service to the community. For this reason, over the last eight years, I have remained committed to listening and addressing residents. I have hosted biannual town hall meetings, open door office hours from 2 to 6 p.m. on Fridays, advocated for transparency tools on the city website, and I've circulated monthly newsletters to keep residents informed on city updates and legislative initiatives. City of Coral's, Coral Gables is an incredible place to live, work, and place. I have remained an advocate for our city and have sat on numerous boards throughout the years, such as the Business Improvement District, the Green Corridor Board, the Transportation Planning Organization of the County Governing Board, Miami-Dade's County Fiscal Priorities Committee, the Junior League of Miami's Co Community Advisory Board, Miami-Dade Miami -Dade League of Cities, and the Coral Gables Hospital. I will continue to do what I have done for over eight years and move the city forward with a transparent outreach initiative, which has the temperament necessary as a leader to ensure that our residents have a seat at the table. I will take any necessary steps to engage residents in meaningful dialogue. All right, thank you all very much. Uh, we'll now move to questions and answers. Uh, one twist from our previous two panels is that um, uh, if candidates, uh, if, they're, if one of the candidates uh, realizes that their name has been invoked, they will get a chance to offer a 30 second rebuttal uh, if they're mentioned. Um, and um, with that, we'll, we'll begin uh, rotating, uh, beginning with Ms. Kian uh, with the quest first question. As you all know, this Tuesday, the city commission voted four to one to advance a package of zoning changes for the Miracle Mile. These changes would cap buildings at four stories and ban parking and new structures. If this package of changes is fully enacted, how do you think it will impact the Miracle Mile? I think it's a very good opportunity for the mile. Um, you know, right now, most of the, the majority of the parcels along the mile of the stores were built back in the 50s. It's a very, very long time ago. They, um, and they're in need of renovation. The cost to renovate a one-story building generally exceeds the value of, the, of that building, allowing them to develop a little more within the cap that has been, um, has been put in place, gives them an opportunity to renovate, to add to their business, to be able to share that rent or the rental spaces and the cost over maybe three spaces or four spaces. They may choose to do residential, they may choose to do commercial, but whatever it is, it, it makes them, it will, I think, spur the redevelopment of those spaces in a much better way than they currently are. Mr. Lago. Thank you, Doctor. To me, I think it's a travesty. It is an upzoning and we need to call it what it is. What has happened on the mile is something that I have been trying to minimize over the last two years. We have allowed a developer to come in who wanted to bring in a nine-story building on Miracle Mon Ponce in one of the most sacred streets in Miami-Dade County. That I remember this street when I was a young boy with my grandmother walking 
on a daily basis after she would pick me up every day from school. The city, the downtown is not dead. It is thriving if you visit it. What they have done in the first reading is increased the FAR from a 1.45 to a 3.5 and allowed for four stories. Right now on the mile, you have no building over three floors. And in my opinion, this upzoning will significantly hamper the visual beauty of our Miracle Mile. Uh, Mr. Holmes. Thank you all very much. Um, you know, I used to believe Mr. Lago, he was my hero. And then I found mm -hmm. out that in uh, obscurity, he was actually promoting uh, six stories on Miracle Mile and it's on tape and you can watch it at the uh, remote parking workshop, I think of December 19th, 2019, saying the exact opposite of what he just said. And that's when I became disillusioned with him. Uh, you know, uh, I guess it, it's great. He can say one thing to developers, uh, but it was on tape. Watch it, please. He's saying the exact opposite of what he said tonight. Uh, whereas I'm consistent and I, I pledge to you, I, I, I try never to lie. Right? Now, anyone who says they're going to be George Washington, they're lying already, right? But uh, I, have, I don't lie. And uh, what I submit is we need to try to repeal some of these zoning code changes. They're, they're going to ruin our city. People, children will not be saying, look at the Wawa project. Children are not saying they chose developers over the safety of children at Carver Elementary. Uh, Mr. Lago, would you like 30 seconds to respond? Whatever you like. Thank you. Uh, doctor, uh, I have the utmost respect for Mr. Holmes. I've never advocated for six stories. The code currently allows six stories and 70 feet. But the issue is that the code requires for you to build parking. And what my colleagues on the commission voting for was for remote parking, which will allow for a four-story building. My vote on first reading was a clear no, four to one. So the gentleman to my left can say what he'd like to say, but it, my vote speaks for itself. Thank you. Can, can I rebut? Sorry. Uh, the next question is uh, first addressed to Mr. Lago. Um, as of now, at least three of the, of the four city commissioners uh, will be male after the next election. It is possible this election could result in an all male commission and mayor. Would you consider revising Coral Gables electoral rules to promote gender equity in future electoral cycles? Well, as the father of two young girls, I take great pride in women and their ability to lead. Uh, I get bossed around a lot at home. So, to me, I think it's a great opportunity for women, for minorities. As, as a Hispanic male, I'd like to see more engagement for minorities, and especially women in this community to get involved with politics. Uh, I think they're an untapped resource where they have so much to contribute. And I see it every single day, not only with my two daughters, but with my wife. So I would be willing, yes. Uh, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. Um, I, I do need to add for the last subject matter. I have emails from Mr. Lago, emails, uh, saying he didn't want to see Miracle Mile go up even one inch more or less, right? I have emails rebutting and proving false what he just said. Um, you can see him. Anyone who wants to see him, send me a uh, notice. I'll show you the emails. Um, yeah, the gender thing, I, I, it's just the first time I'm hearing the proposal that it actually be codified. Uh, having a law degree from the University of Florida, you know, that would expose the city to possible litigation. But sure, I mean, do, do, don't all of us in this room hope that the women win? Uh, you know, women are the peacemakers. If women were running governments, true or false, we wouldn't be in, in most of these crazy wars, right? Um, so I'd give it every consideration. Thank you. I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Keene? Um, you know, I I don't regard as a woman, I don't regard myself as a minority. <laughs> I, um, I think there probably are more of us than men in the pop general population. So, you know, I think it's a matter of encouraging women to run and it's um, and helping them, you know, that women stand on the shoulders of other women. And I don't think that we need to dictate to, to anybody how we should, um, the gender, of, of people who serve us in elected positions. I, I think that 
it's a matter of us getting out there and helping other women and talking to other women and, and learning how to write that check that men do so much more easily than women seem to do, um, you know, to support women. So no, I don't, I, I don't think so. I think we're fine. Um, the next question is addressed first to Mr. Holmes. The Miami Herald reports that the Florida Senate is considering legislation to prevent cities and counties from enacting their own policies related to uh, solar power, natural gas, and energy infrastructure projects. As mayor, would you lobby the state legislature against any restrictions on local authority? Short answer, yes. Um, I, I don't, it's, it's, it's not an always black or white issue with Tallahassee versus us, but when it comes to the environment, I'm 100% yes on your question. Uh, you know, we could, we could get into the details and they get uglier the more you talk about them, but we, I don't believe we can trust Tallahassee on the environment. That we're the ones that drown, so to speak, when sea level rises and Miami Beach is underwater as predicted by 2060, right? It's not Tallahassee. So of course they're not worried about it. We have to take care of ourselves. And uh, I, I was, you know, talking about uh, environmental issues like, you know, sea level rise and so on. Charlie Crist, when he was governor, proposed that we become the, the world's energy provider with fuel cell technology at Cape Canaveral. We can do that. We can replace Saudi Arabia, uh, help the world clean up its act, get get better environment and become the richest place on earth, Florida. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kim. I would work very, very hard and diligently to stop the... Um, the Florida legislature to preempt any local or any home rule options that we currently have. All right, Mr. Logo. Thank you, doctor. Um, I would oppose any preemption on home rule. I'm a big advocate of home rule and I've been to Tallahassee on behalf of the city uh, to ensure along with commissioner force to ensure that we advocate on behalf of city issues as the only elected official in Miami-Dade County, and in the state of Florida, potentially, that I'm aware of that has solar panels on their home and that also has a fully electric vehicle. I've also passed legislation that went all the way, and I appreciate the support of my colleagues on the commission, but I'm the one that wrote the legislation and fought for uh, the, the banning of polystyrene and plastic bags. And we took it all the way to the Supreme Court where the Supreme Court preempted us. So I am a staunch advocate for home rule, and we need to do everything in our power to strengthen local powers so we can deliver for you, the resident. Thank you. All right, thank you all. Uh, the next question is for, addressed first to Ms. Kean. The Historic Preservation Association of Coral Gables wants to designate dorm buildings right here at the University of Miami to be historic. How will you balance the needs of a university to build a brand new building and tear down the old one uh, versus preserving a historic part of the city? Did you direct that to me? Yes. Um, you know, I think that the university needs to meet the needs of the university on the campus of the university. And I think they do need housing. For most neighborhoods, they would much prefer that your housing is here on campus than, um, than in the neighborhoods. <laughs> but I think you need to serve. You need to serve the needs of the, of the, of the university. And um, I don't really believe that the dorms serve as that much of a historic monument that we would preempt the university from serving the university. Mr. Lada. Thank you, doctor. I happen to live in front of the University of Miami. I happen to look every single day at all the structures here at the University of Miami. And I praise the University of Miami's relationship with the city of Coral Gables. But the University of Miami has one problem. And that problem is that they're landlocked. So they have to continue working on their development agreement and they're running out of development. And as they knock buildings down, it goes against their development agreement, the amount of square footage that they can build. So to me, I have advocated for years in regards to historic issues in the city. If it's been acquiring the white way lights that are gonna be installed uh, across from Burger Bob's to revitalizing shotgun homes using the funding that I was able to attain through Xavier Suarez at the county, which is almost $600,000 or if it was to building the coral rock wall at the Merrick House, which is included in this year's budget. I think it's time 
that we do something with those dorms. And the University of Miami has done an exceptional job, as you can see, around delivering beautiful dorms. And I think this may be the next step. Mr. Holmes. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm going to brag about myself for a second. You're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. My, my godmother, uh, as I was growing up, was Dorothy Ash Dunn, which people at the University of Miami know is uh, Ash is the founder. Her father, Bowman Ash, founded the university. Uh, she's, she's gone on now, but um, I can tell you she was a magnificent angelic woman. She was just absolutely an angel. Um, so I have the highest regard and the highest uh, adulation, adulation uh, for the University of Miami's recent achievements under Donna Shalala, uh, continuing with, with Mr. Frank, and I have a lot of trust. On the other hand, should they catch this fever that's, that's permeated Coral Gable City Hall of, yeah, let's go with runaway development, let's destroy the past in the name of developer profits, then of course we want to uh, not just stand by. So I, I think the historical uh, proposal has some value. Okay, uh, thank you. The next question is for Mr. Lago. Um, would you support changing the housing code to allow metal roofs, which are less expensive than tile and more resistant to hurricane damage, uh, but would change the aesthetic identity of Coral Gables. Thank you, doctor. That has already been entertained one time before, and there was a window where I think a handful of metal roofs were approved in the city. Uh, I would not entertain it for any historic properties, but the historic, the, excuse me, the metal roofs have a value, especially for our, our aging population. Being in the construction industry, when you have to change your roof probably every 20 to 25 years. So if you own a home and you live there like my parents or hopefully God willing, I continue to live on San Amato with my wife till old age, we may have to change our roof twice in our lifetime. Metal roofs are easier to maintain. They're, they're uh, again, they're easy to uh, fix and they have a longer life period of up to 50 years. So I would in certain instances, especially not in historic though. Uh, Mr. Holmes. Yeah, so um, I was in the fight on the uh, metal roofs when it was argued, you know, back, God only knows, eight years ago, maybe more. And it's, it's a tough subject, uh, you know, in terms of aesthetics. But um, I, I, I come down on the side of uh, our saving our lives from uh, sea level rise and all the other environmental changes. So, I, you know, if it's responsible, I would support it. All right, uh, Ms. Kian. I served on the planning and zoning board um, for eight years, and this was the subject that came up when we were on the planning and zoning board and was talked about extensively. There are areas of the city where the unifying um, identity and concept are the barrel tall roofs uh, in the city. And so there are areas where it may not be appropriate to have metal roofs, but there certainly are a number of areas in the city, particularly in the southern parts of the city where, they are, where the architecture is newer and uh, the homes are, are currently being built that could be designed and could have metal roofs. Um, I don't see any reason why they don't belong in certain parts of the city. We have a board of architects that would, could make that determination easily. And I think it's another thing that should come back for reconsideration. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next question is addressed first to Mr. Holmes. Uh, how do you view, view your relationship with city staff and administration? Uh, how will you work collaborative, collaboratively with your fellow colleagues? Okay, uh, that's very nice, uh, whoever asked that question. Um, I've uh, counted as an asset that uh, I've attended for the past 22 years, approximately two thirds of all city commission meetings. So um, I'm, I'm just thinking of different staff members that I've uh, told jokes to and, and gotten them laughing. And uh, uh, we, we, we like each other. Uh, and the city commissioners, uh, I, I have been very unhappy with this whole zoning code change, but for 22 years, they haven't kicked me out yet, right? Uh, uh, so, I, I, think, I think it's good. I mean, there, there's something that comes with hanging around City Hall and that's uh, getting to know people. And like I said, they haven't kicked me out yet. 
Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kean. Um, you know, I, I have served on so many and various city boards throughout the city and worked with city staff for a very long time. Um, and I've served as a commissioner here for, for the last eight years. I also worked for Jimmy Morales as a policy aide in the county and um, his district included the city of Coral Gables. So my work with the city of Coral Gables is, is extensive and long. And um, I find I have a very good relationship with city staff and I'm very respectful of city staff. And I think they in turn are, are equally as respectful. Mr. Lago. Thank you. I also think I have a great relationship with city staff. It's a staff relationship based on respect and accountability. I interact with staff probably six to 12 times a day, uh, dealing with resident issues, business issues. But something that I did uh, about two years ago has served me very well. I started setting up weekly meetings with our city manager, assistant city manager, and our city attorney. And these meetings have been to address issues that we're having with residents or issues that we're having with the business community. And that has paid significant dividends. It's paid significant dividends because it's transparent and allows us to really address these issues and not let them linger before they fester. So my relationship with staff is one of mutual respect and accountability and one that's based on delivering for the residents. Thank you. All right, thank you all. Uh, the next question is addressed first to Ms. Guillen uh, and it is about bike pass. Uh, a very detailed question, actually. It, it, it notes that, that uh, both you and Mr. Lago uh, voted against bike paths um, on Alhambra Circle and then on Riviera Avenue. And culminates with, please tell us why someone that cares about cycling and believes it is a way to reduce car traffic should vote for you as mayor. Well, I think the issue of bicycles on Riviera sort of got shut down um, very quickly by the mayor who, who happens to run the meeting. So <laughs> that discussion ended very quickly. Um, but there was a lot of, you know, protests by people that lived along Riviera. So it was in response to that and probably maybe it wasn't the right moment to have that discussion. The issue along Riviera, along Alhambra Circle was dealing with some of the bridges and, and how they narrow. And, you know, for a long time in the city, um, the residents have been responsible for for the swales in front of their homes and maintaining those swales. And they have assumed um, ownership of those swales too. So anytime we go to use the swale for, for a public purpose, um, there usually is uh, a lot of protest. I think that yes, we, we do need bicycle paths in our city. We do. And we need to figure out a way to, to get them. But I think that there is a tremendous amount of grassroots effort that needs to be done with the community to find that way. Mr. Lago. Thank you. Uh, the issue, I mean, I don't wanna blame the mayor. Uh, he does, he is the parliamentarian, but at the end of the day, we have, as a commission are the ones that have to take the vote on the matter. And we're always gonna bring back the item if we like so on the next commission. Uh, the issue did not come to fruition in regards to bike paths because simply the residents came out in support against the bike paths. And I wanted to, sit, I wanted to side with those residents. Um, again, do I think that we need bike paths? I think we do, but I think there's, there's an opportunity and there's a place and time for it. When you have an upswell, the residents that are not in favor of this and they come out in droves, we as elected officials need to listen and we need to respect those residents. And for Mr. Holmes, a more general question. Uh, do you support adding bike lanes along the major arteries of Coral Gables? Okay. Um so it's, it's a difficult question uh, uh, for all of us, I think, because our, we all want to uh, be greener, lower our uh, carbon dioxide footprint, uh, but yet we all, uh, I'm, I'm a rideshare driver. I, one night uh, by accident, I almost collided with, with someone on, on a bike over on, my, on South Beach. And I thought, geez, what if I'd hit him, you know, and, and, and I noticed he wasn't wearing lights and so on. Uh, we need to, it needs to be regulated to make sure that uh, bicyclists are, are visible. My recommendation as a rideshare driver, I spent a lot of time on the road, is that our bike paths, I, I'm, I'm in favor of bike paths, but they should not be on the main arteries. They should be 
on side streets. Why? Because there's less traffic and less danger. We don't want people getting run over. If, if we have bike paths, and it's a, it's a good thing, they need to be on less traveled roads. It's safer. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, the next question goes first to Mr. Lago. What pieces of legislation have you authored and gotten passed by the commission? Uh, this is a great question. Perhaps pick your favorites. Well, I'm very proud of this, and that's why I brought this with me. Here we have hundreds of pieces of legislation that I've written over the last eight years. And that's something that I take great pride in that I always announce in my newsletters every single month when I send them out. But here are the top 10. The top 10 are where we banned poly, polystyrene and plastic bags. Where we got the funding for the underline. It took seven years, but that funding is going to come from impact fees, not from taxpayer dollars. The solar ordinance, where we took away all fees for anyone that wants to install solar in their home, like myself. Uh, when I outlawed hourly motels on A Street, along with the Joint Enforcement Task Force with the City of Miami and West Miami, which allows us to deal with drug dealers, uh, pimps, and prostitutes. The park funding legislation which is going to bring over $20 million to the city for open spaces. The 25 mile an hour legislation, which reduced the, the speed limit. The trolley funding for weekends, which is coming this year on Saturdays. And last but not least, the lead ordinance, which will bring energy efficient buildings to the city of Coral Gables. Mr. Holmes, what would you propose as your first and most important piece of legislation? Repealing uh, the zoning changes to the extent that we legally can. Um, I, I hearken back, people wonder, you know, do I have the depth to do a good job? Um, uh, lots of us remember 2001 when you, you had a, a, a clean slate of change on the city commission. I hope I'll be part of a, a new clean slate. They, there was a um, uh, city hall annex already being constructed. And so you would think you can't stop that, right? Well, what they did is they, they voted to pay off the construction company to um, uh, undo the annex that had been built to, you know, the pilings and so on. They paid them something, uh, 6 million, 1 million, I don't know what, but, uh, but they left and there was no city hall annex. We need to, re my first effort would be to repeal everything we can of these zoning code changes, which are, are ending Coral Gables as a suburb. Uh, Ms. Keen, back to the original question. What, what pieces of legislation have you authored and gotten passed by the commission that you're most proud of? Well, you know, I think there are plenty of rules on our books, adding layers and layers of more bureaucratic red tape. And I think the quality of legislation is far more important than the quantity of red legislation that, that we may write or produce. I'm very proud of the legislation that I have sponsored that protects our waterways in the Bay. It protects our tree canopy, makes certain that children are included and accommodated in our city, and condemns the anti-Semitism, bigotry, and discrimination. All right, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is addressed first to Mr. Holmes. Uh, what is your position on updating regulations, such as removing the prohibition on a restaurant serving alcohol within a certain distance of another? Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm really glad that whoever it is, you and the other person who, who posed that question, because um, I, I'm, I'm going to uh, say something. Uh, thank God we're at the Chamber of Commerce, but maybe other people will be disappointed to hear this. Uh, I am pro small business. I am. Uh, I want to fight for small business in this age of coronavirus, when I believe my, I, I'm a, a mom and pop property owner on Miracle Mile, and we were told by the county mayor shut down or else for two months. And you know, I say, well, what about all my debts? Well, that's your problem, right? Uh, how many people were put out of work? Uh, maybe un undocumented immigrants and committed suicide uh, when they were told you can't work, you're, you don't have documents, so you're not going to get a state check, you're not going to get a federal check. How many people committed suicide? I'm a fighter for small business. So we need to try to be less regulatory in this era. Ms. Keen. With regard, you know what? <laughs> I almost forgot what you were answering. The so the... The, uh, the question, um, 
I seem to deal broadly with the with the notion that the city has uh, some very specific regulations that, uh, on businesses, particularly restaurants. Um, the one mentioned here is restaurants serving alcohol within a certain distance of another. Uh, one of my favorite coffee that? shops was shut down because like the, there were regulations on like the size of umbrellas. So, well, I, I think that you need to be careful. You know, the job of government is to incentivize good behavior and it is to regulate bad behavior, but it's not to regulate everything for the sake of regulation. Um, I, I don't think there are any regulations about the number of restaurants that can serve alcohol in their proximity to one another. There is regulation with regard to serving alcohol and within its proximity to schools, but um, I don't think there is any related to uh, the proximity of restaurants to one. There is some discussion about, um, you know, what's considered a bar and what's considered a restaurant. And there is some regulation on our books that you have to serve more, uh, more food than you do um, liquor or beverage. And with the cost of beverage, what it is today, oftentimes a bottle of wine is more than the food that you're going to eat for two people. So I think it needs to be looked at. Yeah. Mr. Lago. Yeah. You know, like I mentioned before, you know, the first hundred days got willing in office. It's going to be a time for listening. It's going to be a time for meeting with the chamber, with the business improvement district, to come and sit down with all the restaurants and really listen to what their needs. And having spoken to a lot of restaurants during the pandemic, uh, as we dealt with the issue of outdoor dining and gotten those permits streamlined with our economic development team, as I visited them one by one by one to get these permits taken care of uh, with Julian, who's an exceptional addition to the city, they brought up this main question. And the question was that the food to beverage balance is in proportion, it's not working out. It's too one-sided. So we need to take a hard look and see how we can maybe balance that in a way that it doesn't hurt new businesses from opening up and allows existing businesses to find a way that they can thrive. All right, thank you. Uh, next question goes first to Ms. Kean, uh, and it is, Name one specific policy where you differ most significantly with your opponents. Um, gee. I, I, uh, I can't tell you that there's terribly significant differences on, uh, on, on some, of the, some of these issues. You know, possibly, possibly development seems to, uh, seems to come up often. Um, but, you know, I feel that we, we hold developers or I hold developers um, to the code. I, uh, I ensure that they build what they can build, where they can build. Um, I don't, you know, I think it's a matter more than such policy differences. I think it's a matter of temperament. I think it's a matter of long-term, your ability to look at, both issues that are today's issues and the issues that are long-term issues that, that we may, we need to begin to deal with today because we will experience them in the future. So I, I don't know that it's, um, I think it's more that than anything. Mr. Laga. Thank you. I think there's really two and commissioner mentioned one is development. I've been a staunch advocate for ensuring that our city height limits are upheld and I voted against projects that are in significant magnitude and they're out of scale in proportion with the city. I can give you a list, but out of respect, I'll withhold that list. But I think also the big issue is really involvement in the city. It's what is your commitment to the city and to its residents and to the business community? Are you going to be present? Are you going to be there every Friday? Are you going to be there every day? Are you going to meet with residents at their homes? Are you going to go to the business community? Are you going to sit down and meet with them? We have a standing open door Fridays from two to six o'clock. We do town halls twice a year. We have a newsletter that comes out. We're the only elected official in Coral Gables that does that on a consistent basis, year in and year out. And I'm proud of that because, again, we serve the residents. And sometimes we have to sit down and deal with very tough issues when they come through that door. Thank you. I'm not sure how that differs, though. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure how that differs. You asked different. I, I, was, I was waiting to hear where it differed. 
Mr. Holmes. Well, um, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm looking now at the camera up here with the voters and I'm reaching out to you. Uh, there's a big difference between me and my opponents and it comes down to the zoning code and runaway development. They're for it in no matter how, how different ways they spin it. Um, uh, and I'm against it. And I submit to you all that um, uh, the city has not even told us how much they're letting, how, how much bigger houses they've already, but my opponents have already voted to allow, right? Um, I, keep, I kept asking, they refused to talk about it, right? And then you have the mayor saying, oh, well, we've told you everything, but they haven't. See, it's another thing. This is the second issue of uh, honesty, right? Honesty. Uh, I'm the one who's talking the truth here, which is we are losing Coral Gables as a suburb. They won't even tell us how much bigger the houses, how much bigger the apartments, how much bigger uh, the, the, the multifamily. Uh, the Miracle Mile thing, it's not going to work. They're, they're, so there's no parking they're giving. This question is addressed to uh, Mr. Logda. Uh, what do you think the city should do to uh, head off the expected uh, rise in sea levels uh, as it affects the, the coastal areas of Coral Gables? Well, what I, think it, what I think we should do is first set an example. And I think that starts with the elected officials. We're trying to limit the amount of CO2 emissions, and that's why I put solar on my home five years ago. That's why I drive a 100% electric car. That's why I've written every single piece of legislation that deals with sustainability, sea level rise, recycling, lead in our city. We need to be the most progressive city when it comes to sustainability and understanding that sea level rise is real. And we need to continue to do what we're doing where we're saving away for a rainy day, close to $2 million a year, to ensure that that money, when the water starts to rise, we have prepared our infrastructure. We also need to go to the federal government. We need to go to the state and be honest with the residents that this is not a task that the city of Coral Gables can undertake by themselves. We need to do this with assistance from government agencies at the federal and at the county level and at the state, excuse me, because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we continue to call the great city beautiful Coral Gables. Ms. I'm sorry, Mr. Holmes. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and I, I like what Mr. Lago said about trying to get money from the federal government. We all know, uh, I'll brag about myself, I lived in Switzerland, I got to see, you know, I never saw the dikes in, in uh, the Netherlands, but we need to bring them in to get their advice, you know, like they have uh, barriers to the sea, right? The boy with the finger in the dike, uh, they, they can teach us a lot. You know, we may end up having to have dikes, you know, if you think about it, because uh, Miami Beach is going to be uh, mostly underwater by the year 2060. Miami Beach will be mostly underwater. But so Gables by the sea, all you millionaires, look, look at what we're facing here. Maybe we need that. Maybe we got to get those people in the Netherlands over here to help us, help protect us and uh, get some money from the federal government. Sea level rise and global warming are, are, are global issues and, and we need they will be dealt with globally. You know, what can, what can we do within our own city? You know, I don't think there's anything I'm going to do with China or Brazil or India, but within our own city, what can we do? We know that about 16% of all of the carbon um, put emissions come from cars. And we need to start by getting people out of cars. We need to work on mass transit. We need to build around transit hubs. We need to encourage bikes. We need to encourage other means of transportation other than individuals in their cars all alone spewing emissions into our atmosphere. The uh, next question is addressed first to Mr. Holmes. Um, would you make training mandatory for our police and fire departments uh, to ensure that they uh, interact well with our special needs population in the Gables. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope you don't mind if I take just a moment to compliment you. We, we've had some great moderators before you, and you are as good as they are. I mean, I don't know you that well, but you, you've got a very uh, soft manner about you. And I, I just want to thank you. Uh, you're, you're a great moderator. 
Um, the, um, sure, you know, one of the good things about our police is they're open to sensitive, sensitivity training. And yes, uh, I, I mean, we, we have a great police force. They're very intelligent. They are very sensitive. Uh, and, and absolutely, uh, we, we need, uh, the, the more training they get, the more grateful they are because they want to be the best possible policeman and, and we can help them. We're fortunate um, that we, that the state, that the University of Miami is right in the middle of our city and the CARD Center, the Center for Autism and Related Disorders is part of the, uh, it is here also located on the University of Miami and they work closely with our police and our fire department um, to, to help them understand the needs uh, of, of children or adults, both that are all, all have disabilities. Um, one of our police officers who is a father of an autistic child created what he called a pocket card that they give out through, through UM and, and throughout the city that is a card that any disabled individual can carry that if they're stopped by the police and if they are uncomfortable and if they're having a problem with speaking, all they have to do is take out the card, they show it to the police and it explains that they have a disability and there's a contact number on there as to who they can contact. Now that came out of our police department in conjunction with the card center here at UM. Mr. Lago. Yes, um, in reference to our police department, we have a world-class team that represents us here in the city, both police and fire. Uh, they receive exceptional training, continued training, and that's important that we offer them whatever tools that we have at our disposal to let them refine themselves as much as possible, like we all do as professionals, as we do as elected officials when we have our training on a year in and year out in regard to ethics, in regards to our you know, exact professions. Um, we were blessed to have an individual who worked for the city for a long time. His name was Craig Lean, and he you know, did a lot of work with individuals in this community who are disabled. And he set the ball in motion to make it a priority here. So in this community, you know, we have a lot of people who do great work, but I always like to give Craig Lean his due because he was always a leader and did it in a way that was very subtle and very professional to make sure that we highlighted the needs of the disabled community. So I have no issues, not only the police, but all the employees, including the commission, getting whatever training necessary to ensure that we deliver for our disabled community. Thank you. Uh, the last question will be addressed first to Ms. Keen. And it's based on, there, there actually, there are several different proposed questions that got at the trade-off between uh, basically taxes and services. Uh, and this is the formulation uh, that I like best. What would be your priority? Having an optimum level, optimum level of public spending in order to maintain the quality of life Gables residents expect or lowering taxes and fees? Uh, <laughs> you know, property taxes account for about half of the revenue that comes into the city. It's only about half. Um, and of those property taxes, about 40% of them come out of the downtown. So a lot of our revenue in the city comes from, is a result of fees there, you know, the, the entire building department is supported on a fee structure basis. Parking is a cash cow to every city. And so we have a lot of revenue that comes into the city also from through parking. Then there are other taxes and utility taxes and all kinds of things that, that help fund uh, our city. I think that we need to understand that taxes are the shared cost of government. Fees are, are directed toward or paid for services rendered. And I, I don't, you know, I think that uh, as long as we can maintain our expenditures um, and our, with our revenues, I think that we're fine. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lago. Thank you. My wife and I, every single day, we go to work. She's worked for 19 years at the same job at Discovery Channel. We live in a community that includes a dentist next to me, a banker, a police officer for the city of Miami, a retired couple, 
It's a very mixed community. Teachers, we live next to University of Miami. Every dollar counts for those individuals. Every dollar counts in an effort to try to raise their children, uh, to pay their mortgages, to pay their ever rising insurance and the cost of living. So to me, like I mentioned before, and I put it in my propaganda, the first 100 days, I'm going to call for an audit of the city. Not because the city's doing anything wrong, but we can find efficiencies. I do it in my business every single day. With COVID, we lost over $8 million as a result of the pandemic, and we didn't have to fire or furlough one individual. So that goes to show you that we can find money when we need to find money. So what I would do is try to find efficiencies, and maintain our millage rate at the current position, and provide the best services for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. So I'm, a, I'm a, for low taxes. Uh, I'm, I'm a property owner. And, you know, with your budget, uh, un, unquestionably, my, my, my annual taxes on my little mom and pop property, right, uh, is uh, $25,000 on a lease that's, let's just say, gross 110. So it's, this is a, a very huge problem, uh, to be honest with you. When you combine that with the fact that uh, as I've been hanging out at City Hall for all these years, which is, by the way, it's directed to try and get a department store in the downtown Miracle Mile area. Uh, uh, the city has thwarted me at every turn on this. They say, oh, look, Miracle Mile is horrible. It gets because of them, right? We have uh, H&M department store wants to come and they're saying no. Anyways, um, but with the exception, lower taxes with the exception of police, fire, and trash pickup. Former Mayor George Corrigan told me, taught me, uh, voters want us to spend the money necessary for great police, great fire, great trash pickup. All right, thank you all. Uh, and now uh, we transition to final statements. We'll begin with Mr. Lago. Thank you, doctor. I'd first I'd like to, in closing, thank the chamber, University of Miami for their hospitality. The city of Coral Gables is a great city. And great cities think about what they are going to do to look like many years down the road. As a father of two little girls, I want to work towards creating a city where residents thrive for generations to come. I intend to thoughtfully plan for the future of Coral Gables and transform the city into a magnet of opportunity where residents can live, work, and play. As mayor, I want to give back to this community that has given my family and I so much. I'm running because we need to protect and enhance the quality of life of our residents. I'm running because I want our city to continue serving as a global destination for businesses and visitors while we continue to rank as one of the best cities to live in. I am confident that I would be a good mayor because I have the temperament to work with anyone. I listen to everyone and I am committed to placing the needs of Coral Gables residents first while your city forward. While your city forward. Ms. Keen. Thank you again to the chamber for take, making this forum possible. We are all very fortunate to live in this wonderful city. As wonderful as it, is, as it is, there is still work to be done. As your commissioner, there are many important issues I've worked to try to solve, some that we face daily and some that will affect us well into the future. For example, I pushed to establish detailed financial performance measures that directly led to Coral Gables receiving AAA ratings for our city's finances from all three national reporting agencies. I, re I believe that there are only three cities in Florida that have achieved this recognition. I led the initiative with Miami-Dade schools to ensure Coral Gables parents knew where their, what neighborhood school their children would attend while reserving a, a preference to the international program at Sunset Elementary. I also work with the school board residents, parents, teachers, and students to increase funding for the renovation of Coral Gables High School from 12 million to over $40 million. So we will have the first class facility our city deserves. I've worked with the county and FIU to address sea level rise and water quality of Biscayne Bay. And possibly more important to the residents who have called me directly, I've made sure that potholes get filled on their neighborhood streets. Certainly one of the most important issues we have always had to address is how to manage growth and development. And while some people might want you to believe otherwise, my record clearly shows that I've consistently voted to preserve the integrity of our neighborhoods and to protect the value, our property values. I've been a leading voice to reduce the height of buildings and hold best developers accountable to our zoning laws. Those are facts. Mr. Holmes. 
So I think I lucked out by being last here. I want to, uh, again, try to connect with voters. Um, you know, we've, we've had a zoning code rewrite, which I, I uh, keep saying is the end of Coral Gables as a suburb. Most of it has been passed already. Um, and I think, I was born in Coral Gables. My grandfather knew the, the city's founder, George Merrick, um, third generation. So our, our best asset in the city of Coral Gables is uh, our high achieving residents and voters. Uh, I don't wanna pander to you by saying you, you are our best asset, but uh, residents are, and uh, they prize, don't we all, more than anything in their lives, they prize the safety of their children. They will sacrifice anything, but not the safety of their children. The developer uh, elected leader Cabal that we is now running our government. Citizens United permitted the government, uh, permitted developers to unlimited money to PACs. They control our city development. We've got to take it back. I ask for your vote uh, because um, my two opponents are part of the problem. They voted for these uh, suburb ending things. I, I mentioned Wawa. If, if you look at that vote, they, they voted for giving, for enriching the developers at the expense of the safety of children. Our people will move out. They don't want their children in danger. All right, on that note, uh, I wanna thank you all very much for a very interesting debate. I've been uh, impressed by the, the the quality and the, the intensity of the candidates for mayor and, and of the candidates for the city commission. Um, I wanna thank you all for joining us tonight. Coral Gables TV has filmed the program tonight and will be replaying it over the next several weeks. Uh, you can consult www.coralgables.com for information on its rebroadcast. Uh, it will also be available on demand on our chamber's YouTube channel uh, at Gables Communication and the city's channel as well beginning tomorrow. I would like to thank Sora Global's advisors, Stearns Weaver Miller, the Coral Gables Democratic Club, uh, Gables Good Government Committee, the League of Women Voters of Miami-Dade, the University of Miami, and the Coral Gables Chamber of Commerce, Business and Government Affairs Committee. And of course, thank you to all the candidates for their particip participation in this important forum. Election day. Is it Tuesday, April 13th, with early voting on Saturday and Sunday, April 10th and 11th? This is a first for the Gables. Maria. I want to, first of all, thank you so much to the candidates. An amazing, amazing discussion. Thank you. And, and again, I want to thank the University of Miami. Um, I also want to thank, um, of course, the Coral Gables Chamber. Mark, you're amazing. Thank you so much, our leader in this, um, our moderator. I agree with Mr. Holmes. You've been terrific. Thank you very much. Um, remember to vote on Tuesday, April 13th. And then if necessary, there will be a runoff. Um, and that will take place on April 27th. The last day to register to vote in this election is Monday, March 15th. And then I just want to remind everyone that's a member of the Coral Gables Chamber, our next Business and Government Affairs Committee uh, meeting will be held on Wednesday, April 14th at 8 a.m. And it is via Zoom. Again, thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy your evening. Have a keep safe. And um, we'll see you around. Thank you. Thank you.